um, and it's a little bit live stream now. Can you please keep your microphones on mute? If you'd like to speak, raise your hand or uh, or put it in the chat. Um, this is a formal meeting of the council of living in Hackney, but obviously we're all online. Um, are there any decorations of interest? No, no, no decorations of interest. Um, apologies. I think we have several apologies. I've got apologies from um, Councillor Lynch, who's unwell. Um, we have apologies from uh, Chief Superintendent Marcus Barnett, who I believe is unwell. Um, and <laughs> Councillor Mahan will be a bit late into the meeting. Um, he's uh, dealing with childcare issues at the moment. So I think we'd like to wish um, Councillor um, Lynch um, and um, Marcus um, Barnett both uh, a yes. safe recovery. Um, I haven't got any other apologies. No, okay. no. Right, I've got no urgent business. Um, I'd like to, um, and there's no decorations of interest. I'd like to welcome everybody to this meeting uh, tonight. Um, this meeting start well. The work we started this work in 2019 uh, when we heard about the work um, that um, Hackney was doing. Hackney um, uh, Borough was doing about the uh, police were doing uh, about Borough uh, sorry, about body worn cameras um, and the work of the account group. Um, since then, we've had a follow up meeting in June, um, which. We, we still thought there was lots of questions and wanted to ask more questions both of the police and the Independent Pla Complaints uh, Commission as well as the uh, Mayor, MOPAC which is the Mayor's Office of Police um, and Crime. I do think that we have an important role as a scrutiny for, uh, committee in the London Borough Hackney to look at these issues. Um, Trust and confidence of, in the police is going down amongst our community, and there's been a significant dip in uh, trust and confidence since uh, 2017 um, with the death of Russia and Charles. And also, we do know also from looking at the stats, we know that stop and search is incre is increasing, and the and handcuffing um, has also been increasing, over, especially over the last three years. So, and the, we we are here to represent the community and take on board their views um, as their elected representatives, and try. And we also need to try and work with the police, who are there to protect everybody. Although some members of our community, if you read the reports, don't don't feel they are being protected by the police, and we need to try and work together um, to try and make sure that we can find a way forward where us as a council, our community and the police and the mayor's office um, can all work um, together to try and uh, move things forward. Unfortunately, um, as we found out in the summer um, from what happened to George Floyd in America, um, that uh, the black community um, faith in, in the police isn't always as what it should be because of the way the police act. And we also know that it's a global problem where minorities and the work for minorities uh, and the place um, together. I don't always minorities don't seem to fare well against when it comes to policing. We all know that um, minority blame people are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, and there's been a really excellent report by David Lamy MP uh, on that issue, which is in your packs um today so that's why i'm mentioning it and although it's not specifically on stop and search he does mention stop and search is an issue in that report so i'm pleased that we've got all our invited guests today and the discussion will cover as i said uh, metropolitan police the mayor's office our local uh, police and um we're going to be discussing public concern over the use of stop and search and the work by the police and MOPAC to build trust and confidence with the local community and work towards a fairer and more inclusive policing. 
and understand how the IOPC works, who just brought out a report that we were discussing tonight on stop and search and community policing, and we'll also cover their review. The questions have been sent in advance to all the speakers, and written responses were provided in the agenda under item 4A from um, the Borough Commander's Office for Hackney and Tower Hamlets um, and Mopac. One of our questions to the borough commander covered our commissions called the following areas stop and search, trust and confidence, accountability, handcuffing, fair and inclusive policing, sources of intelligence, community engagement work relating to building trust and confidence. Our questions to IOPC covered the following areas the powers of IOPC in relation to recommendations they make to MSPS. The roles of IOPC in relation to the police complaints, their success in relation to influencing policy and recommendations and getting them implemented and information about the IOPC reviews, review of stop and search. Okay, I'd like to introduce um, guests uh, for the question and answer session. Um, First of all, I'd like to introduce um, from the Mayor's Office for Police and Crime, Natasha Plummer. Plum Plummer, yeah. Thank you, you Natasha. We'd like to take good a second off no. Yep, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Would you like me to continue or are you going to introduce everyone else first? Okay, yeah. Um, I'm Councillor Sean Patrick and I'm uh, Chair of uh, the Commission. Uh, perhaps people could introduce themselves. Councillor Etty. Yeah, um, my name is Councillor Shadi Eti, the Vice Chair for Living in Hackney's Coaching Commission. The person on the number ending 03, sorry. Good evening, everybody. I'm Catherine Roper. I'm Commander in Charge of Crime Prevention, Inclusion and Engagement, and thank you very much indeed for having me. Councillor Rapp. Hello, I'm Councillor Penny Roos. I'm the um, member uh, representing Victoria Ward. Councillor Vagina Thomas. Councillor Vagina Thomas is with us. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Susan Vagina Thomas, Cabinet Member responsible for community safety and enforcement. Good to be here. Welcome uh, to your first commission meeting, uh, Councillor Vagina Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I've got a private caller, but no number. I'll come back to uh, you. Councillor Rathbone. Yep, I'm Councillor Ian Rathbone, and uh, I'm a Leebridge councillor. I've been on this uh, commission for a number of years. Thank you. Jason. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Davis. I'm the policy lead in policy and strategic delivery at Hackney Council. Um, and I have a brief which covers cohesion and uh, community safety partnership. Jerry. Hello, Councillor. I'm Jerry McCarthy. I'm the Head of Community Safety, Enforcement and Business Regulation. And I deal with a lot of issues related to the police. Right, OK. Uh, Natasha, do you want to say who you said who you are and you work for the Mayor's Office? Uh, Nicola? No. Sal, um, from the IOPC. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Sal Lassine. I'm the Regional Director for London at the IOPC. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for coming today. Councillor Williams. Uh, my name's Councillor Williams. I'm the Cabinet Member for Equalities for the Council. I'm not a member of the Commission. But you're w very welcome, um, thank you. Williams. Thank so you. It was nice to, to, right. So it was nice to have Cabinet Members attending. Um, obviously, this does cover your brief um, and your equality grades. That's Ozan. Hi, everyone. This is uh, my name is Councillor Ozan, and I'm a field sport. Okay. And I believe the private caller is um, 
What's the place? Good evening, Councillor. Um, yes, Act Acting BCU Commander Mike Hamer and my colleague Andy Port, Superintendent Andy Port from the Neighbourhoods. Uh, I'm representing Marcus. Yes, and we know, we know Marcus isn't coming in. You were stepping in. Thank you for stepping in um, today. I think we've got everybody. Nicola, have you, are you online now? No, we'll come to Nicola later. I can... Um, um, yes, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm Nicola Babineau. I'm chair of Hackney's Stop and Search Community Monitoring Group and Hackney Independent Advisory Group. Thank you. Sorry, right, Jane, Natasha. Another private caller. All right. The Connors is also here. Right, OK. Is that Tim Connors? No, no come Jane. on, Jane. Jane Connors sorry. from the Met Police. Hi. All right, sorry. Jane from the um, what's your rank, uh, Miss Connors? I'm a, I'm a commander. Thank yes, you. Com commander. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, uh, private calls can only can can only moot, moot and unmoot themselves. Would you like to start, Natasha, please? Thank you. Um, so, as you said, I'm Natasha Plummer. I'm the head of engagement at the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime. Just to give a bit of background, MOPAC, as we call it, is led by the Mayor, Sadiq Khan, and he works with Sophie Linden, who's Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime, who, of course, was one of your councillors until she came and joined us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she leads MOPAC on a day-to-day -day basis. Our role is to provide oversight of the Met Police, ensure delivery of the Mayor's Police and Crime Plan, um, which sets out his strategic ambitions for crime and policing over the four-year mayoral term, and to also work with partners to drive effective criminal justice and crime reduction services across London. So the Mayor sets the, st the strategic direction and the budget for the Met um, and ha also has considerable influence and convening power to bring partners together to problem solve and shine a light on key issues affecting Londoners. Um, important distinction though, he doesn't have operational control of the Met and cannot direct the Commissioner. And this is an important principle of UK policing and perhaps a key difference with our policing system compared to some others around the world. For my part, um, community engagement and community scrutiny sit within my brief. And this takes in our wider stakeholder engagement work through targeted roundtables, for example, and things like the use of COVID-19 powers and hate crime during lockdown, um, as well as ongoing and important work with safer neighbourhood boards, independent custody visiting and stop and search community monitoring groups. So this meeting this evening is obviously really kind of very timely. Um, trust and confidence is really central to the principle of policing by consent upon which uh, UK policing is built. Um, so it's absolutely fundamental to the work of the Met. Now we know that when people have confidence in the police and regard them as legitimate, they're more likely to be satisfied with their individual encounters with police officers, um, also to kind of comply with police authority and importantly to assist in uh, police investigations. So the way in which um, policing is viewed, how powers are used, such as stop and search, or perceived to be used by communities, is really critical to maintaining that trust and confidence and also delivering effective policing in the capital. So public confidence is one of the key indicators that we measure and have tracked over a long period of time, and we do that through our public attitude survey. And um, the main measure we use as our kind of headline indicator is based on the question that we ask people about whether or not they think the police in their area do a good job. Um, and at the moment, that measure is sitting at about 58%, um, in Hackney at 58% 58 for London, 56% for Hackney. Um, and we know that in Hackney, it consistently tracks below the London average. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Councillor Patrick, confidence levels have fallen um, in the last three or four years. And this somewhat tracks wider societal impacts of things like austerity, um, the period of considerable change and uncertainty we've been going through with things like Brexit also having happened during that time frame. Um, but it has now stabilised at 58% and we would hope to see that begin to rise in the coming months and years. So for our role in this space, in practical terms, it's kind of twofold for MOPAC. Firstly, as I said, overseeing the work of the Met right across the piece. So that includes, you know, their work on community engagement, trust and confidence, stop and search, crime reduction, all of those things. Um, but we also um, seek to support and enable communities to engage and scrutinise the police at the local level. 
Now, we do our uh, discharge our functions kind of by holding the commissioner and her senior team to account for delivery. And we do that through a regular um, program of one to one meetings. So the mayor meets the commissioner every month. Uh, the deputy mayor is meeting her and also the deputy commissioner on a regular basis and through also our formal oversight board. And both the mayor and the deputy mayor use those opportunities to kind of interrogate the data, challenge the, mayor, uh, the commissioner and her senior team on performance, but also to raise and challenge on things that we know matter most to communities, the things that are really concerning um, for them um, during this time. Um, another way in which we do that really is through transparency and bringing transparency to, to policing really um, through the publication of a variety of data sets and information. So, you know, from general crime data to uh, public voice data. Um, information about complaints and also police workforce statistics, for example. Um, the Met also publishes a whole range of information that enables the public to interrogate and scrutinise what the police do um, and also how they deliver for communities. And I, you mentioned also about Hackney Account, and I know they have um, done their own qualitative work in this space, but also used a lot of that published data to really good effect to challenge and scrutinise what your local officers are doing. Um, and that's exactly why that information is put out there. So it's really good to see that they've been able to do that. Um, you'll be aware that we also fund a network of borough safe and neighbourhood boards, and it's their role to kind of hold the local police to account um, and to enable some of that local community engagement work um, with the police and community safety matters. And also they're able to fund local crime reduction and engagement projects. And for Hackney, we, we um, enable you to have about £29,000 a year for projects. Um, and that supports the work of the Safe and Neighbourhood Board. And a, a further piece of work that we do is that we work with communities, as I say, to enable that community scrutiny of key aspects of policing. And that ranges from things like our work um, with independent custody visitors who are looking at what happens in police custody through to stop and search community monitoring, which, which Nicola has already mentioned. Now, in this arena, clearly, the, you know, the issue of stop and search, which I know is one of the things you're really interested in, that's a really important policing power. Um, but we all recognise that, you know, it's quite an intrusive power, you know, allowing, as it does within parameters, officers to put their hands in people's pockets. That That's quite intrusive. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for trust and confidence and police legitimacy that it's evidence-led, conducted fairly, professionally and proportionately, and seen and felt to be so by communities. Um, and I'm sure Jane will talk about this more later, but, you know, that's a really key, key thing for um, the Met and for us. But we know, obviously, from the data that, uh, disproportionality is, is apparent and is a, a cause of concern for communities um, and based on the resident population for instance we know that black individuals for Hackney uh, are 3.5 times more likely to be stopped and searched compared to white individuals and we track that disproportionality data over time um, so we, we that is one of the key things that we look at all of the time and so as part of our work in that space as well as the scrutiny that the mayor and deputy mayor are conducting on a regular basis we're also supporting as I said a network of stop and search community monitoring groups who are scrutinizing that data at the local level um, and that's a really important function that we that we enable communities to do it's important for that legitimacy that they are able to be involved in those kinds of conversations but also that they can feed that into the work that we do at the center so 2020 has obviously been you know a particularly challenging year for all of us in many respects um, and certainly the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent protests around the world have rightly brought policing everywhere under uh, increased scrutiny um, and, you know, we, we have absolutely heard that call. People have made lots of representations to us and the mayor's committed to developing an action plan for addressing trust and confidence in the police. And we've been working on that for some, some months now and we've been developing that with communities. Um, and based on what we've heard, we've developed a plan which we will be launching hopefully very shortly um, that kind of looks at four key areas that I think will help to address um, concerns around trust and confidence, but also to improve people's trust and confidence in policing. The first is around better use of police powers, which looks at things like um, the consistent handcuffing policies, um, disproportionality across a range of different tactics and police tools. So things like stop and search to the use of tasers, handcuffings, as already been mentioned. Um, and then the second theme is looking at how we work together with black communities to keep them safer. And, and this is really about developing a new framework for engagement between the police and communities um, and enabling more accessible opportunities for a wider range of people to be in those conversations, partly to help with that problem solving piece, but actually also to make sure that we can fully understand, um, uh, you know, how people are experiencing policing on the ground. Um, and I think that's a really important piece, but also it will take in our work with safer schools officers and thinking about how, we, you know, they're effectively supportive to build good relationships with young people in schools, um, also to help keep them safe, for example. 
And then the third strand is around um, building a police service that better represents and understands black Londoners. Um, and that we've had this message really clearly throughout the work that we've been doing um, on the action plan that uh, firstly, people want the service to better re reflect them and reflect London. Um, but more importantly, they want a service that, you know, can really uh, be seen and felt to be able to operate within the many and varied communities that we have in London. Um, and so this work will focus on the recruitment and retention of black and minority ethnic officers at every level of the service, um, but will also importantly, and this is uh, different really and new, highlight the ways in which communities and young people can get involved in recruitment and training. Um, actually to, to build that and make that more open and transparent, but also to bring that lived experience into that work and in, in, in empowering and training officers to operate in the London context. And then the final strand of that work will look at kind of the work we do around holding the police to account. And there are a couple of things around that. Firstly, we do, you know, I'm sure um, uh, Commander Connors and Commander Roper will both tell you that there's lots and lots of oversight and we do lots of accountability in MOPAC. Um, but it's become really clear through our conversations that the public doesn't necessarily see that or recognize that or know that. So it doesn't build confidence in communities if they don't know it happens. So there's something about how we make all of that more transparent, make communities more aware of that happening, but also um, really crucially, how we build new and um, broader opportunities for communities to be involved in that scrutiny. So we will, for example, um, be building city-wide scrutiny mechanisms that will enable the public to be more involved in that, but also thinking about how we broaden out the remit of some of our borough level scrutiny. So perhaps not just looking at stop and search, but thinking about the use of taser locally and other police powers. So it's quite a lot of work that's gone into that. And there's certainly a lot of work for us to do in this space. We're building on a good foundation, um, but we recognize the strength of feeling from communities that more needs to be done more quickly. Um, and for us as MOPAC, there were some challenges for us in that too. Um, you know, specific commitments for us, as I say, in ensuring that we work to better inform communities about the work that we do and how we are holding the Met to account, um, but also enabling people to understand um, their rights and responsibilities in this space. You know. It helping and working with the IOPC to make sure communities understand how the complaints process works, for example, and making that more accessible. Um, and then we will, as part of that work, have some specific opportunities for MOPAC to be held to account really for the oversight that we do of the Met in delivering the plan. Um, the important thing about the plan will be that there'll be lots of activity, um, but we want to be able to understand and be held to account by the public for the experience and the way in which policing feels um, you know, out on the ground, um, having moved and changed. Uh, we don't want to be here in another four or five years time with people saying, well, you know, your your indicators might have moved, but we don't feel differently about it. And we understand it's really important to get that kind of trust and confidence, but also the perceptions and the feelings and experiences of communities um, to improve so that we can actually have uh, better relationships across communities and build a safer London. I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Councillor Patrick, for now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Natasha. Um, well, I've got the police um, in the run next in the running order. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to manage that. And perhaps we can hear from. Uh, if I I'd give five minutes to um, Commander Roper and um, sorry, I've lost the name of the other police officer. Um, Jane, sorry. Sorry, sorry about this. Uh, no offence. Um, Commander Jane Connor. Jane Connor. Sorry, I couldn't find my briefing now. Uh, I've got uh, two, three computers on the go to try and find out where I'm. Yeah, so if I can give five minutes to uh, Commander Connors and uh, five minutes to Council, uh, Commander Roper. If we start with Council Con uh, Commander Connors first, if we go in alphabetical order. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Chair. This is this is uh, Catherine Roper. Would it be possible to start with me, only because yeah. I I work across the organisation in terms of community engagement, and I can probably set the scene for some of the more specific stop and search elements. Yeah, that, that my that's colleagues absolutely would fine. I was just you. trying to be uh, find a reason to put one above the other, and alphabetical seems as just, good as reason as any. That's quite right. Quite right too. So good evening, everybody. My name is Catherine Roper, as I've said, and I'm in charge of crime prevention, inclusion and engagement. Um, I have three strands to my department, which is the uh, crime prevention strategy, the diversity and inclusion strategy 
and also the engagement strategy. And I set the tone for the organization. Um, I set the strategy for the organization. Uh, and I hold the rest of the organization to account for a lot of the activity that they do. The reason why I'm here this evening, and I am delighted to be here this evening and, and, and welcoming the uh, undoubtedly challenging conversation that, that we're going to be entering into, is because um, I have been in post since March, uh, and one of the um, strong messages that I've had from our communities is actually that they're not seeing and they're not feeling all of the activities that we inside the Met know is happening, but we equally know that we should be doing more. So as Natasha has already reflected, 2020 has been an absolutely unprecedented year. We've never policed, and none of us have ever, in all of our personal circumstances and responsibilities, and we've never known anything like it. And policing has been exactly the same. Uh, and because of that, at the beginning of this financial year, actually, the trust and confidence in the Met was beginning to uh, look quite positive. People were beginning to feel that uh, we were... Uh, that, that, that we were informing them about local policing, um, that we were doing things that, that the local um, communities cared about. Uh, and then March, April, May happened. And then there was a real slump in terms of the public attitude survey, the trust and confidence, particularly within our black communities, particularly after the murder of George Floyd. And of course, with the outpouring of frustration and dissatisfaction of a lot of our communities, but of course, particularly our black communities in London, um, and I was part of that process. I was there working with our communities. I have a list, a very, very long list of people that my department engaged with almost on a daily basis. And they were giving us the feedback saying, what you're doing simply isn't enough. And we knew that we weren't talking to enough people. So, for example, at the beginning of um, COVID, we didn't have a, a Chinese and Southeast Asian community. And of course, they started suffering from hate crime at the beginning of, of COVID. So, so we, had to, we had to really reach out as far as we could. Uh, and myself and my team absolutely did so. Um, and we also injected greater community engagement in a lot of our normal policing processes, for example, public order. Uh, my colleague Jane Connors is a public order commander, and she and I have worked together to inject much more community engagement there also. So as we progress through the year, as we try to talk to more and more of our communities, as we have the feedback, which is what you're doing just isn't working, of course we know it's not working, which doesn't mean we're not doing a lot. And, and we really are. The amount of effort and energy, and I'll go into much more detail after I've done my opening gambit, but I'll go into a lot more detail throughout this conversation. But the Metropolitan Police constantly injects a huge amount of energy into community engagement. But it's clearly not having the impact that we would want, otherwise we wouldn't be having these conversations today. And one of the areas that we realized that wasn't being as successful is in our BCUs, in our frontline policing, with my colleagues that are on the phone from Hackney, um, they, there was inconsistencies across the organization in terms of how we were engaging. Um, we didn't actually know fully who we were engaging with, which means, of course, we didn't know fully who we needed to engage with more. And I've led a group of people this year to try and resolve that. So I'm delighted, and I know that it's been circulated as part of the pre-reads, that um, we now have a, a minimum offer, a minimum commitment uh, within frontline policing to every single BCU. So, to excuse the phrase, but the postcode lottery of what service and what access you may have to, to your local police service, that's now been made consistent. We are increasing our scrutiny processes, and again, I'll go into more of that um, as, as the conversation goes on. Um, and also, we are trying to make sure that we keep our communities better informed um, and, and trying to make sure that we respond to the feedback that they're giving us. But we're still in unprecedented times. We're still operating in a, in, a, in a time where we've gone into the next uh, lockdown, where some people feel that, that that's an entirely unreasonable way to be, to be working. And, and so we're trying to very gently navigate our way through that. So I'm very grateful for being here tonight. Um, I know that we're going to be talking about stop and search. I know you're going to be asking me for much more specifics than this very general introduction that I've given. But I can tell you that we are absolutely committed. The commissioner has made it absolutely clear that she wants to be the most trusted police service in the world. She's had two priorities. One is violence and to bring violence down across the capital. And the other is to improve the trust and confidence uh, from uh, within between the MPS and, and our communities. And we know we've got a lot, lot, lot more to do. Um, so I will pause there because I know we'll be getting into more detail. But thank you very much again for inviting me and I look forward to the further conversation. Thank you very much, Commander. Right, um, Commander Connors. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to echo Catherine um, to say thank you very much to everybody for the invitation and the opportunity to, to be here this evening. 
I think I'll just give a, a very brief overview of my role. Um, I know that you've heard from Catherine and Natasha, and I think there's probably a lot of questions that people would want to ask us, so I won't take up too much time. So I'm Commander Jane Connors, and I lead for violence within the Met, and also one of my portfolios is Stop and Search. And the, the key aspect of my role is to look at consistency and accountability of the officers within the MPS to make sure that we are scrutinised um, and that we understand the impact and also to ensure that we're visible and able to respond to our communities and to make sure that we do have consistency across all the different BCUs, but not just the BCUs, the actual Pan-London units as well, so the Violent Crime Task Force and the TSG. So it's my role to oversee, stop and search across the NPS and try and make sure that we are doing it properly, doing it effectively, listen to our communities and make sure that we can give that feedback and improve um, as we move forward. So I'll leave it there if that's okay. Thank you. Um, would the local police like to come in? Um... Superintendent, um, Superintendent Hamer, perhaps if you're back in uh, at the Deputy Borough Commander tonight. Uh, thank you, Councillor. So um, we, we were posed two questions in particular. I don't know whether you want to uh, me to sort of go into those now. One was around briefing and tasking. How, how does that happen? And on what information do we base stop and search? And I think the other question was around our engagement. I, I'd like, if I can, in this meeting this evening, to talk about our really informative um, and actually groundbreaking work that we're doing around our own internal stop and search review um, that we are supporting uh, Commander Roper with and that's a, a real deep dive into our, our stop and search uh, every encounter uh, it's not lost on us that you know we police, police with the consent of the community we need to work with them um, I, I think we do largely and, and very effectively um, but there's a lot more we can do so by way of introduction, uh, that's where I'll pause. But if you'd like me to go into any of the, the detail, then I can do it any time. Okay. Um, and I'm joined. I'm joined by. Um, I'm joined uh, alongside me by uh, Superintendent Andy Port. Yeah. So Andy. Andy looks after the um, the uh, community safety teams, the uh, safer neighbourhood teams, and is our lead engagement officer. Uh, in, in support of Marcus uh, and, and myself. Okay. Good I, think, I think one of the things that members were discussing and would like to know, but we can you can perhaps give us a highlight, although we've had it before, is how you use um, intelligence because uh, I'm not sure that we've really hit the nail on this because I think the the uh, what the information that when we asked last wasn't didn't really fulfill that at uh, the question that we asked it was a bit general uh it was very general and so we keep hearing that stop and search is, is based on is often intelligence led so it'd be interesting to know what the bcu uh call intelligence led policing okay stop and search specifically so I can, I can probably talk through that in about five minutes and then pause for questions if that would be okay. beneficial. Um, we, we did ask Tracy whether uh, a presentation would help. Um, we were told that you, you were disinclined to, to ask for presentations this time. It would be more of a dialogue. So, um, so yeah. I'll, I'll, give, I'll, I'll yeah. give you a verbal, I'll give you a verbal uh, presentation then. Um, so you're right, information is the foundation for um, our, our tasking and in a lot of senses our stop and search work. Uh, the information we, we analyse, uh, we can do that in different ways or we'll assess it. Uh, then we, we task uh, officers to particular issues and we've heard already from Commander Roper that, uh, that the priority is knife crime and Commander Connors is the lead for knife crime so that is uh, sorry, violent crime. So that is knife crime, gun crime, uh, robbery. Uh, those those sorts of street-based offences are, are are the commissioner's priority. Um, and then we look at the results we get from that tasking, and then the situation kind of repeats. 
um, we, 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 we put the result back into the information, if you like, and, 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 and around we go again. So um, where do we get our information from? Well, we, we, we get it from uh, the crimes that are recorded. Uh, and in Hackney, we record approximately 80 crimes a day. Um, we, we look at what the victims tell us, because uh, they're most impacted by it, uh, what witnesses have seen, uh, and we also use other resources um, that are available, uh, such as the CCTV, uh, be that uh, Hackney Council uh, or private. And you'll appreciate there's been a proliferation of private CCTV through, you know, ring doorbell, um, through dash cams, etc. So, so that's one way we get our information. We also get our information from the public, uh, either face to face or from uh, calls uh, for service. Uh, typically sort of antisocial behaviour type calls, calls around drug dealing, about weapon carriage, about um, groups gathering, uh, and in recent times obviously around COVID. Um, we Sorry then to got interrupt you, obviously, obviously uh, yeah, we've heard all that before. One of the things that the Commission, we are, the commission really wants to know is, is how you decide you're going to stop and search a particular a person or a group of people. We are, obviously we understand the broad, the broader picture, but I think the commission is particularly interested in how the police come to their judgment about how you who you're going to stop and search, who you're going to handcuff, because time and time again, through all the stats that we've got. None of this seems. None of this information comes out. We keep hearing it's intelligence-led policing, and no one keeps. No one has told me in any of the reports I've read, and I've read a few, what intelligence-led policing is. And I can understand all the things that you're saying. Members understand them, but what we really want to know is what the suppose the clerk and the Bobby on the beat, uh, what he or she sees, or what happens to make them stop somebody and obviously there's a perception I know it's not a perception but the stats as we now show that disproportionately black and ethnic minority people get stopped and searched um, and that's one of the big um, things that the community um, is concerned about it's what we're all concerned about the police are concerned about it. we know the IOPC are concerned about it so could you perhaps tell us about you know, what, how it relates to Hackney? Sure, so um, I, I think the first point to get across, and I can't get it across too strongly, is um, the grounds, the reasonable grounds to stop and search an individual or a group of individuals is, is held personally by the officer. It's what they see, what they hear, uh, and, and it comes from um, either their own observations it comes from what a member of the public has told them in relation to that group or individual, or it's as a response of tasking, wider tasking. Because we, we, we have finite resources and we want to put our police officers in the areas where the crime's happening, at the times it's happening, um, and with as much information as possible. So, so the, 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 the grounds to stop and search, I, I, I do not tell officers to go to an area and stop and search. I don't do that. I tell them what the, the fundamental issue is, what the victim offender location time profile is, and we have analysts that help us with that work, and, and we can task our officers to it. It, it. it might be that the officers are responding to an emergency call where there is very specific information and very specific descriptions about people involved in that particular call. Um, or it might be that a patrolling officer sees something that, that isn't right. Um, and their professional judgment leads them onto a position where they um, have an engagement with, with that, that person in the public. Now, that may or may not lead to stop and search. So, so I think um, what, I, what I can't do is um, offer specifics around individual encounters and stop and search in Hackney because... Um, there are a number of stops that take place every day in a variety of circumstances and for a, for a variety of reasons. I think where our focus is, is understanding through a, a deep dive, through the review of body-worn video, the review of supervision, the review of the recorded grounds for stop and search, the review of complaints data, wh whether um, 
we, we're satisfied that that has been sufficiently articulated and justified. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. I'll come back to you in a minute. But one of the things I'd like to throw out there, and we can come back to it in discussions, you talk about the best use of your resources, and all the data shows that um, you get about a 20% out, uh, positive outcome, as the police call it, um, on stop and start. Which I wouldn't say was a was a particularly best use of resources. It seems to be very really <laughs> miss who you stop and search. Um, so it'd be interesting to talk about the best use of resources because if I was allocating resources, I wouldn't necessarily say that a twenty percent hit rate um, is a particularly good hit rate. And obviously, no nothing. And that's just people who get a warning or get go to court. Um, but what we don't know and is what that hit rate is in the sense of whether it's Warnings, it's warnings people get are actually people taken through the criminal justice system and found guilty of a particular crime and what those crimes are. Um, so it's uh, something that you can all we can think about. Um, we can get perhaps discuss it when we come to the questions because I know it's something that certainly that my council colleagues um, have got lots of questions and are concerned about. Um, so if I can call on um, Sal from the IOPC now, if you want to unmute uh, yourself. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Patrick. Um, first of all, thanks again for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the IOPC tonight as Regional Director for London. I am really grateful to be here. Now, stop and search. Now, I've just paused for a couple of seconds there. Now, but from experience, I know that those three words that I've said would have provoked a range of very different thoughts and emotional responses from everyone attending and listening tonight. Those thoughts and emotions might have come from lived experience, they might have come from having carried out uh, a stop and search, or they might have come from working closely in this area. We know that for policing, stop and search is a necessary tool, which is part of the policing toolkit. But we also know that for members of the black community in particular, it's a policing tactic in which there is disproportionality and it also corrodes their trust and confidence in their relationship with the Metropolitan Police. As the IOPC, we recognise both positions and also the real importance of those two words, trust and confidence. Our role at the IOPC is to help maintain public trust and confidence in policing by ensuring that the police are accountable for their actions, that lessons are learnt and that there is an effective police complaint system. But what does all that mean when we relate it back to stop and search? I think first of all let's start with an acknowledgement that we know that there are concerns around engagement in the police complaint system. From our own research we know that last year 33,000 people brought complaints against the police. But from the data, we also know that only 4% of those were from members of the black community, only 1% were made by young people, and less than 1% of the total complaints made were about stop and search. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us two main things. Firstly, that the complaints data in this area, it should not be used as a barometer by policing to assess whether communities are dissatisfied with the use of stop and search. Secondly, it also tells us that black communities and young people, both of the groups with the lowest levels of confidence in policing, are also the least likely to engage in the system that's in place and designed to take forward their concerns. Now, as Regional Director for London at the IOPC, this is an issue that I'm really conscious and aware of. And we have been making stringent efforts to address this through various means, through our ongoing community engagement strategy, work, work with our own IOPC youth panel, joint presentations with MOPAC and the Met Police, and broader media work to raise awareness of the police complaint system. Now, from speaking to communities across London, I often hear, why should I bother making a complaint? It's only the police investigating themselves. It's something that comes up again and again. 
Now, while it's right that the vast majority of complaints do go back to the police for them to look at, it's really important to highlight that if you are unhappy with the outcome of your complaint, that's not the end of the road. You still have a right of review to either the, either the mayor's office or the IOPC for the most serious complaints. So you've got a right of appeal at the end of that if you're dissatisfied. Now, in terms of the challenge of why actually bother making a complaint at all, I'd like to highlight the work that we've done on the thematic learning recommendations and stop and search, which I know you've mentioned already, Councillor Patrick. Now, I led a piece of work which looked at all of the completed investigations we had at the time, which featured stop and search. These were five investigations, all featuring black men. Instead of looking at each case in isolation, we wanted to look at them together to understand the bigger picture and what were the key themes and trends coming out of this. Now, this work I mentioned is important. I made 11 statutory learning recommendations to the Metropolitan Police based on the evidence we found. The learning recommendations have been made at an organisational level because we want to avoid the same issues around stop and search from happening again. We consulted with community stakeholders, young people and organisations working in this area when drafting these recommendations and they all gave them their wholehearted support. Now, the six key themes which we found were um, a lack of understanding by officers about the impact of disproportionality on communities, poor communication throughout the encounter, consistent use of force over seeking cooperation, namely handcuffing, the failure to use body-worn video from the start of the encounter, continuing to seek further evidence after the initial grounds for the stop and search were unfounded, and finally, the smell of cannabis being used as the sole ground for the stop and search. Now, it was quite interesting that the evidence we found matched those same kind of concerns being expressed to us by communities across London. Our review highlights the need for the Metropolitan Police to better support their officers on the front line to do their jobs effectively with the right training and the right supervision so that they can get stop and search right. Now, as I said earlier, stop and search is a policing tool, but like any tool, it needs to be used with care and in the right circumstances. By making our learning recommendations, we hope to help both the Metropolitan Police and particularly black communities across London address the gap which exists in the relationship around trust and confidence at the moment, because the reality is it is strained. In terms of dealing with any problem, the first step is an acknowledgement of the issues which need to be tackled. As such, I think it's really important to, to recognise that the Metropolitan Police have accepted all 11 of our learning recommendations. Now, the next very important challenge after identifying learning is obviously improving and then doing. And this is something which the, which the Met will be taking forward and they, I'm sure they can cover in more detail a bit later. Now, my closing thoughts here would be that none of this important work that we've done here, addressing the bigger issues around stop and search, would have been possible if those individuals hadn't taken the conscious step to do something about their concerns and make a complaint, which we then investigated. Like any service, the police can only improve when you tell them when something's went wrong. And for me and for the IOPC, this is the importance and the value of the police complaint system. That's probably all I want to say at this stage, Councillor Patrick, but if there's questions that come up during the evening, more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of accuracy or clarification to anybody that's spoken? Many of the Commission members. I don't see any hands. Um, I wonder if we sure. can then go and. Sorry, Councillor Ette. Thank you, Chair. Um, I okay. thank you, Chair, and thank you to okay. everyone. What can you hear me for attending yeah. the um, the commission? I just I want to, I want to 
put a question to um I can't remember the last the um su detect super Mike Hammer. I think he's the lead for violence. Mike Hammer. Yes, yes. Mike Hammer. Yes, Deputy Borough Commander. One of the reasons why we've been on this journey at this commission and we've had several engagements with the police. And I think it's, it's, it's very good to acknowledge the work that the account has done and in terms of their recommendation. And I just want to mention something from what Yolanda wrote. And she said, are we allowed to leave? It's a great question. And she also wrote a poem outlining the number of deaths in Hackney that has happened in Hackney. I just want to bring that in. But let me go quickly to my question. Um, based on the report, I mean, based on the answer that's been given to us in terms of police sources of intelligence that he's talked about, and in terms of reasonable grants that are formed, and on persons' behavior, it clearly states here that one of the things that is being used to stop and search is bandana. And it says, sweaty, when the person is running from police, let me just go ahead. And it says, wearing clothes inconsistent with weather conditions, gang colors, and in bracket bandanas. And I looked at the definition of bandana. It says, it's a large handkerchief, which is typically with white spot that can be tied around the head or the neck. So anyone can tie the scarf around the neck and the head. It is a, it's an handkerchief. That's why it's called bandana. I want more clarification on that, on why that should be used as a reasonable brand to stop and search anyone in Hackney. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Captain Echo. Um, the young man who put his hand up, I'm sorry, I don't know who you am. Um, perhaps you, he's gone from my screen now. Okay. I'm, I'm still here. Um, oh, right. Uh, Said has said a lot of what I wanted to say for now. Right, okay. So okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to withdraw myself. You're great. So, what, are you from my account? Yes, I'm the head of media for the account group. Yeah. Right, thank you. Because you weren't in the beginning when we all introduced ourselves. <laughs> yeah, we didn't get to okay. introduce ourselves. All right. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps uh, please respond to uh, Councillor Ate. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the, the occasions on which any sort of clothing, I mean, bandanas is mentioned in brackets here, is used as part of the grounds for stop and search is very, very, very seldom. Um, I, I wouldn't attribute uh, much to, to that particular line, although I, I understand full well why the, why the question arises. Um, but we, we, we review grounds for uh, stop and search, and it is never based on, on, on any real aspect of clothing. Uh, we, we have had a sort of Notting Hill Carnival, for example. Um, there have been groups that have uh, identified themselves among larger groups of people um by by clothing colors but that doesn't play out uh in in the streets of hackney as a business as usual uh, activity so 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 please please don't think that that's a significant reason at all um for stop and search in hackney okay does um not, does councillor williams or councillor fajana thomas want to come in at this stage Uh, I'll let Councillor Fiona Thomas come in as she's the lead cabinet member. Yeah. Th thanks very much, uh, Councillor Patrick, and to members of the commission and to officers and Natasha that are here to tonight. I just want to uh, pick up on a few things, in particular around uh, around uh, what Natasha mentioned and what uh, officer roper i believe mentioned obviously what we are seeing we uh, uh, uh the mayor and myself put a statement out this week in regards to the 
IOPC recommendation, which we welcome and uh, glad that MPS have responded that they are taking this on board. But having said that, it, uh, the conversation around stop and set, in particular when it comes to young black men, we've been having this conversation for decades. And as an um, officer, sorry, I, I've forgotten your rank, Catherine mentioned earlier that the M MPS, they're doing quite a lot of things when it comes to uh engagement but they're not seeing people are not seeing it nor feeling it and i'm wondering that you actually let mps know that it's about time that they change the way they engage with the community i think the whole thing around stop and search is more of relationship more of engagement with the community and what we have with community, the community is there, the police are there. And we know that the police are there to protect the community and the trust and confidence that members of the community have lost in regards to policing is about that engagement, that robust engagement that uh, we need in the community. And this is where we need to go back to. And yes, there are a lot of activities happening, for instance, in the borough, there is an SNB and there is a stop and search monitoring group. And I'm wondering what other, what sort of, what support and, and strengthening can uh, uh, MOPAC or, 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 or does MOPAC have in terms of supporting uh, the SNB and uh, the stop and search monitoring group to actually fulfill their role in scrutinizing the police activities that is uh, the first uh, my first question sorry i have there's the bit of preambles before I, I got to that stage and the second question is to find out what how many repeat stops are in hackney if that would be that would be that would be great and to natasha I know you mentioned about this work you are doing in terms of um, or, 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 or black job, and I want to find out from the work you are doing how the recommendation from IOPC are featuring in this work, importantly, about around uh, police and black justice. So I've packed too many things, but I will stop there for now. Thank you, Councillor uh, John. Thank you. One of the things I'd like to put out there is what is different to, to the IOPC and to the Met? What is different this time? We've had um, the Scarman report, we've had the uh, McPherson report, with the police, uh, College of Police, the College of Policing has put out many reports about stop and search, about the treatment of uh, BAME, BAME people, black people. Uh, and now we've got the IOPC report, which it's good to see that the Met has um, going to take on board all the recommendations. So one of the things that I'm concerned about is what is different this time? Is it is it the death of George Floyd? Is it the Black Lives Matters um, campaign? You know, are we really going to see a change um, in what is happening and the way that uh, the Met Police really do engage with um, the community? I mean, council, uh, we've also heard about community groups being involved, and I can see that there is various community groups. Uh, we don't know who they are um, or what role they seem to have, or who they represent. I mean, if you read the account um, group recommendations, they talk about uh, young people being involved, um, that these group, groups ought to be proportionate to the communities that they represent by age, by gender, which makes sense. Um, we took the, I've heard from the police they took about um, the work that's going to look at body wall cameras, and that's one of the things that we found last year was that the use of body wall cameras certainly in uh, Hackney and wasn't being used, uh, they, they weren't being used correctly, they were often being hidden by clothing. Uh, and um, but there, there's a lot of talk about using body wall cameras uh, to be 
to look at them and to review the evidence of how stop and search goes. So I welcome that. But I do think there ought to be a wider use of the community in looking at that evidence, perhaps like the Northampton project, uh, where the community where the community sh is shown um, redacted body worn um, videos of what's going on. I think we really do have to build the MPS has to build trust and confidence in to the community and show why this time at this t um, things are going to be different because as I said you know we've had the first report we've had Scarman report yeah you know, I really hope that this time something can be different so I think I'm, well, you've heard from myself and Councillor John Thomas uh, to open this debate and I wonder whether anybody else wants to come in into the debate This is Catherine Roper. I'm very happy to hear if there are any more questions, but if not, I could perhaps start answering some of those, if that would help. Uh, yeah, somebody else seems to be desperate to come in at the moment. Uh, I'd like <laughs> to come in, actually, if I could. Okay. Well, sorry, Kat, I'll take you in a minute. Yeah, I've Did got you... a question as well. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to ask your questions then, and then, then they can respond? Okay, do you want to go first, Penny? Okay, I will do. Um, I suppose my issue with regard to public confidence is that what we need to see um, is some stats from the Met to tell us how many officers they've disciplined for not wearing their body-worn cameras properly, or indeed how many officers they've disciplined for misusing the handcuffing force when it wasn't appropriate with stop and search because unless we see those sorts of figures to see that the Met is actually taking this seriously it's very hard you know you, you've got lots of very fine words we've heard some very good intentions and I've, I'm sure they're quite sincere but actually we need some evidence that there's some difference on the ground and so I'd like to know when we're going to see those figures published. Um, I do have a suspicion that the Met won't want to publish those figures because you're afraid that actually it will destroy confidence in the Met by publishing them. But I would suggest that actually it's the other way around, that if you want to get real confidence in what the Met's doing and that it's taking these issues properly seriously, then to show us that you're acting on them is really the best way to go. Can I just ask one secondary question too, which is about engagement. Um, there's a statistic there about the, the youth cadets. Um, I think it's, a, I can't remember, it's 120 or 160 young people in, involved in the youth cadets. It's a bit unclear whether that's in Hackney or across London. Um, if it's across London, that is a pretty shockingly low figure. And the other thing I'd like to know is about the use of the Black Police Association, which at one time was very active in helping with engagement with uh, young people and people from different different um, ethnicities. I wonder if you're still working closely with the BPA to to try to overcome some of the barriers. Thanks, Councillor Patrick. I've finished. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rathbone. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to say something in case um, it doesn't get said that um, on page 58 and 59 of the account report there is an excellent poem by Yolanda Lear and I just wanted to commend that poem and say thank you to Le y Yolanda, I think she is here, um, for, for writing it because I've been around in Hackney for a very long time and I do remember Colin Roach onwards and uh, that poem was a very evocative poem so thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, more, sometimes more effective than a whole report a poem can be. Um, but I just wanted to follow up. Uh, the chair asked about uh, what was the cr criteria for um, stop and search, and she also mentioned handcuffs. And I didn't hear an answer about handcuffs from Mike Hamer. Um, but what I did hear from him was, first of all, that he couldn't really give us any criteria. But then when Councillor Etty raised the issue about the bandana, he was very clear about that. No, we're not going to be doing that. That was just an isolated thing. So how is it that, you know, bandanas came to be 
decided upon as an issue, but now they're decided not, not to be an issue. Uh, and I, I do think the police need to be more open about what their criteria is. Otherwise, we're in the dark. We still don't really know how it is that somebody gets stopped and searched. Um, and I think that's, that's really one of the real cruxes of all of this. Why is somebody stopped? What is the criteria that is used? And also, why are handcuffs used? At what point are handcuffs used? Uh, there must be some form of understanding, if not training, going on in this regard. Otherwise, you just have individual police officers deciding whatever they like. And I can't believe that that is the situation. So I wondered if you'd just be really specific about what exactly it is or what kind of things that are used um, as criteria in stop and search and, and for handcuffs. Thank you. So, um, sorry, this is Captain Roper again. Shall I start answering some of those questions and I'll hand over yes, to... Yes. Yeah, is that okay? Um, so yes. I'm going to... Is that all right? Yes, please. All right, sorry, I, I got a bit of echo on the phone. I'm sure it's my phone, I'm sorry. So, um, there's been quite a lot that have been brought up in, into those last topics. I will be handing over to my colleague, Jane, for comments around the stop and search and comments around body-worn video. Um, uh, but I'll try and deal with the rest. I have been frankly noticing, but if I miss something, it's not deliberate, so please can somebody remind me. Um, so one of the questions that has been repeatedly asked is, is what's different? And I think that's a very, very fair question to ask. Uh, and indeed, it's one of the challenges that I've been giving myself and my team, which is how, how are we going to make it different this time? We have had an unprecedented year. We are waiting um, and uh, for, the, for the Mayor's Action Plan, which will hold us to account for a whole range of other activity. But we ourselves have also uh, started reviewing and doing things differently. And I think what's different is it's not just about doing stuff. And I'm sorry that I can't think of a better word than stuff. It's not just about uh, talking to more people or having more dial-ins or uh, having more scrutiny panels. It's actually about improving the way that we explain all of that. It's improving the way that we both bring members of our communities into our processes, but we also go out to our communities and explain what's going on and hear how they feel about it. The empathy, the understanding of the experience, the lived experience of somebody who lives in London, of, of, our London, of London's black communities, but not just the black communities, but I know specifically that has been an issue for this summer. I think that the understanding that we need to, we, we need to listen much more. We need to understand that if people aren't, under, if people aren't aware of something that we're doing, it's our responsibility to, to try and improve that. And I think that there has been a root and branch recognition of that across the organization. So I'm going to just give a few examples. They're not the only thing, but we have brought community members in to be helping design and deliver our procedural justice training across the organization to really uh, focus on the lived experience and to focus on making sure that we have fairness and understanding and empathy at the heart of what we do. We have brought community members and IAG members in to train our new recruits on stop and search so they can understand what it's like to be the recipient of that. We are also working with our local communities and we bring them into our special ops room uh, when we're doing public order events so they can actually see the decision making that happens and the briefings that happen. Um, so what's different? It's the fact that we, it, we realise, we absolutely fundamentally realise that if we can't explain where you can reach into ourselves or the IOPC or MOPAC to make a complaint or to have scrutiny over something that we do, then we are letting the community down. So one of the other things we're doing, and I have to say it was alluded to by my um, SLC colleague from Hackney, but one of the other things we're doing is we're rolling out an increased scrutiny procedure for use of force. Now, it's been trialled in Hackney, uh, but it will be rolled out across the organisation to try and invite more people in to scrutinise what we do. Equally, over the summer, we had a central scrutiny board for our um, use of the COVID-19 legislation to try and explain how the legislation was used and, and where and why. So I think it's there's going to be lots of smaller activities which are going to be different and which are going to be nudging us in the direction of trying to improve that trust and confidence. But fundamentally, it's an acknowledgement that with everything that we've done, because we have done a lot, but with everything we've done, it hasn't worked. And with everything that we've done, some parts of our communities aren't aware of it. And that's our responsibility to change. 
So the minimum commitments I spoke to earlier is an example of that. As I say, the rollout of additional scrutiny processes is an example of that. And it will be my responsibility centrally, working with all the BCUs, to make sure that our communities can understand where they can get the information, understand how they can make uh, challenges. We've also involved the community in our diversity and inclusion strategy. So we're really trying to bring the community of London into the heart of what we can do. And, and part of that will be communicating out of that strategy once we, we refresh it and rewrite it. So hopefully you can hear that it's, it's a cultural shift. It's not just about doing more stuff and have it being much more transactional or having it being as transactional. It's actually about the empathy and the understanding and the, uh, the emotion that is attached to what the next positive police is trying to do now. I'll pause there. Are there any more questions around the what's different question? Yeah. Um I've heard what you say, and it sounds very good. And you're talking, you're saying, you're t I'm sure you are talking to various communities and scrutiny pan panels or whatever. But how are the how are the account group and the young people who it talks to, the young people on I say on our streets in our who live in Hackney, who are the young people who feel traumatised, who feel abused by the police through stop and search, through handcuffing. How are they going to see a difference? How are you going to get it over to them that you've changed? You know, what are they going to see? That they, are they going to see less handcuffing, less stop and search, politer officers? What is going to actually going to we're going to see on the ground to make people believe that what you say is going to happen? Yeah, and that's a, a words are cheap. Sorry, words are cheap. You know, action is uh, perhaps more expensive. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, and so how will they understand it differently? How will they experience it differently? Well, I mean, partly, you, I mean, you've got the people on this call who are going to make the difference in terms of your local officers. Um, whilst I absolutely agree and accept and I'm saddened by the trauma and the upset of our young people in London, particularly our young uh, black men, in London who are, um, who are particularly affected by stop and search and their experience of it. We are extremely fortunate that a lot of them are still talking to us and they're telling us how they feel and they're telling the IOPC how we feel. So we do have an opportunity of having conversations and showing them and involving them in the difference in what we do. In terms of how you're going to feel, what the look and feel on the streets of Hackney, there's going to be local training delivered to visiting units so they're aware of the local environment. The lived experience and the, the cultural history of Hackney will be provided. So you'll be seeing a shift in the way that your officers engage with the people on the streets of Hackney, talk to people, explain things, um, and, and as I say, to inject empathy into what can sometimes be quite transactional experiences. Now, that's not to say that every single transaction, every single stop and search will be um, as we wish it to be. Uh, we know that there are some extremely difficult circumstances that everybody, our communities and our police officers, need to manage their way through sometimes but the point is is that your local officers are talking to young people the investment in schools officers is significant as well as the youth engagement officers to try and make sure that we can continue this dialogue um, and and I know that words are cheap I really really do but I can also promise you that we are going to be held to, we are already held to account in a lot of ways and Tassie's already alluded to that but we are going to be held to account very specifically through the action plan we've already had the IPC talking about the recommendations that they've made and that we've absolutely agreed to. So some of this is going to take a little while to kind of you know, become activity. There is an absolute commitment to the Met. And if, if, and if we don't do it, there's an awful lot of people watching us who will be able to highlight if we don't. I know Councillor Rout wants to come back, but what's your timelines? You talk about timelines and this is all going to happen. Um, but a lot, you know, Perhaps you could give us some timelines before I call councils back in. Yeah, of course. What? So the rollout of the additional scrutiny committee um, it, uh, for use of force. I'm just going to bring in my colleague, but I believe it's already active, or if it's not, then it's going to be active soon. Is that right? Local SRT? Sorry, Mum, can you... You, you, you just broke on that bit. I do apologise. So, um, what? When are we having our additional, our first use of force scrutiny committee, our additional one in Hackney? Yes. Yeah, so, just just to put a little bit of um, um, information into that. So, we have endeavoured to uh, review the use of force 
uh, on each occasion and every occasion that it's used around a stop and search setting. That includes the use of handcuffs that's already been mentioned. Um, line by line, uh, we've got a team, a dedicated team of five people uh, that are going to review, uh, review every stop and search encounter. Now, there's, there's two aspects to that. One is how do we recycle the learning that comes from that and how do we, in a timely and proportionate way, um, moderate behaviour, police behaviour if we need to, work on the softer skills around the way we communicate, de-escalate, empathise with people. But what we want to do and what the ambition is, is, is that we will use uh, a community reference group and our, our monitoring framework um, to help support that work um, in the interest of transparency. So, and what we need to do is we need to, to, to play this back to the community because I do, I do fundamentally agree. I think it is a fair challenge uh, around the engagement with young uh, people that are affected most by stop and search. Um, and I think that works underway uh, currently. So, you know, each of these, uh, to review a stop and search in entirety, including the use of body worn video, uh, and uh, again, a point made earlier in September, 93% of every stop and search was recorded on body worn video. Uh, so I think, I think we've made some significant gain in that respect, but, you know, we've, we've, we've got a, a bit of work to go uh, still. Um, so, so it's a, an exercise that's ongoing now, and I think we need um, that work started, but, but we need a little uh, time, as in a matter of weeks, to just confirm the terms of reference for the external engagement that, that follows on the back of this. So we, you know, our ambition is that we will enable some um, public review uh, or scrutiny around the body worn unedited. But we just have to tread cautiously around that because there are some, um, some, some governance issues around it which we're determined to push through. So, so the work has already started and I anticipate in, in a matter of a few weeks uh, we, will have, um, we will be able to open that up to our community monitoring group. And how is that community monitoring group uh -huh. selected? Who, who exactly is it? Uh, do, do you represent, is it representative of our diverse community? Yeah, um, so that question, uh, I'm going to look to my colleague uh, Andy Pork, um, who, who's just actually got off a call with, uh, to our call with the, um, the account group, but um, there, there, is, there is more to it than the account group. The account group is significant, but uh, I'll let Andy explain. So just to come, just to come in on that point, the intention is for that group to be completely representative of the community. So, like Mike just said, just before this meeting, I had a meeting with Account, and we talked about this exact issue, and we talked about the role which Account can play in this, the role which other youth groups can play in this, but the role in which all sections of the community can play in this. So, so in, in answer to your question, we are building this as we go, but the in, intention is definitely for all sections of the community, but particularly youth, to be involved. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jake. Can I come back yeah. in? It's Catherine. Yeah. Thank you. So, are there, um, uh, so in a matter of weeks, there'll, there'll be a date in terms of that. I mean, to bring a group together does take a little bit of time, but in a matter of weeks, you'll have a date. Other work that's already happening is um, there is now a professional standards independent advisory group to scrutinise the professional standards processes in the, over in the Metropolitan Police Service. We're already using community members to help design our training for stop and search and procedural justice. We already have young people come to, often it's virtual now, but obviously under COVID, but come and talk to our new recruits to tell them about their lived experience of being stop and searched uh, and, and to be growing up in London. And there's a whole range, I, I'm, 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 I've got a list in front of me and I, and I could just read off it, but um, some of the stuff is, some of the activity is happening. Um, oh, and, and I'd like to point out, so the VPC comment, um, there's 130 volunteer police cadets in Hackney, there's nearly 5,000 volunteer police cadets across London, uh, and I am the Chief Officer Lead for Volunteer Police Cadets, and the um, diversity is approximately 40% of black and minority ethnic volunteer police cadets, um, uh, so it's a really strong cohort, so whoever raised, if there's only 130, that's a pretty shoddy deal, it's nearly 5,000. And that's in addition to our further approximately 4,000 volunteers that come and help us um, every single day 
Uh, and many of them have actually been working in Hackney and doing positive activity in Hackney, be it leaflet drops or bike marking or safety patrols uh, around nighttime economy areas. So there's a huge amount of, of this work already underway, but the difference is we need to explain it more, we need to highlight it more, we need to make sure that it's able to be scrutinized more, and then we need to be able to listen to the feedback in a way that can then inform what we do next. Okay, Council Rout didn't get an answer to our question about um, discipline. Um, oh, there are a couple of things actually, if you wouldn't yeah. mind, Councillor Patrick. One is um, congratulations on the 5,000 police cadets. That's really good news across London. However, it still makes me wonder why are there only 130 in Hackney then? That is massively disproportionately not enough um, and, and absolutely no reason to be complacent. I think the other thing I'd say is that uh, one of the things I was talking about was stats to back up the fact that you were, you're, I mean, uh, Councillor Patrick's been asking you for how are we going to show people that there's a difference? How are we going to show that something's happening? I handed the, an opportunity to you on a plate to say how you would show the difference, i.e. by the number of officers who've been disciplined in some way or another. It doesn't have to mean a serious dipl disciplinary thing, just the number of officers who've had words of advice or stuff like this. To share those statistics with us is a way of us seeing that something is actually happening. Um, I just wonder why, why you haven't responded to that, really. And just one final thing I want to say before I shut up <laughs> is that um, I was looking at the, I, uh, at the Metropolitan Police's response to the IOPC report. Um, and when it comes to the use of force, you're talking about ways in which you're going to adjust the way that you monitor the use of force um, and ask officers to provide more reasons for the use of force, i.e., in this case, we're talking about largely the use of handcuffs. And there's a, a list of 11 different suggested reasons that are being put forward. Um, they, they're, they're all in the letter there, but they're things like protect the public, protect the subject, protect other officers, prevent offence, secure evidence, affect search, affect arrest, method of entry, prevent harm, prevent escape, other. It seems to me that what you're sort of doing there is, is giving your officers a checklist of excuses for why they've been using um, cuffs to, to, to carry out a stop and search, not really to push forward to, to, for them to justify those things. Um, you know, I think on, on lots of stops, officers might well be able to quite easily tick two or three of those things. It doesn't seem to me to be a very effective way to actually reduce the use of force. Mm. Chair, this is Catherine again. Can I just come back in and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jane. Yeah. Thank you. So I, it's not that I wasn't addressing the professional standards issue. I've got a list of about 10 things that have been raised in the last three or four questions, and I was just working my way through them. Um, so please don't think I wasn't answering your question. It's just I was trying to, I was trying to provide full answers to one bit of the question and then move on to the next point. Um, but in terms of the professional standards element and also talking about the uh, disciplinary um, issues uh, and the body-worn video element, I'm just going to hand over to my colleague, Jane, who is obviously the lead for the um, for the MET in this area. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. So, in terms of the data um, and, and publication of figures, so the MET does have its its stop and search dashboard, and I know MOPAG has a dashboard as well. We're very aware that the dashboard is not very user friendly or easy to use. Um, so, we are working particularly with with Hackney as well because it's come up on a scrutiny group around what are the asks from each local area that they want in terms of data and then we can provide that in. So it's not just providing the NPS level data which is produced on the dashboard, but actually being able to provide the data that each local area particularly needs because there is variation um, across the NPS in particular data. Um, and in terms of that, as you say, visibility of the information and that's where the transparency and understanding comes in. So particularly around the data, that is something that we're, we're working with local areas on, and that will form part of the, the local scrutiny group as well. Just in order to Somebody asked the question about discipline, disciplinary action, because we were told by the previous borough commander in Hackney, whose name I've forgotten, Sir Williams, Susan, um, Sue Williams. Who, Sue Williams, that's right, I wasn't that far up. Who uh, has gone? Who was concerned about body-worn videos and not being used? 
properly and was going to discipline people. Um, and councillors were asked about discipline officers. If if you have been disciplining officers for whatever, for doing stuff and search wrong, for body worn cameras, obviously one doesn't want to, obviously the names are confidential, but I think that you would give some credence um, back to the community that you're actually taking seriously some of their complaints because you keep saying you're going, things are going to happen, but I think we need to see evidence and so far. And, the evidence um, is lacking um, from what I, I can see. There's no evidence about what ev you are doing and how you are going to do it. Um, it's interesting, you know, you can set up these groups and it's great to, um, that you're going to take on board what they say. And in the moment, I'm, some of the questions that have been asked you um, about the Black Officers Association. I'm not, haven't been answered um and also we talk there's a lot of talk about how stop and search is done and it's important it is done correctly but i think members and uh, are still very concerned about why stop and search is done the so-called intelligence behind stop and search uh, how and as council Rad just read out you know Anybody could tick those those um, boxes. I mean, I, anything. I cover almost anything. Um, but those uh, criteria, and I really think people won't have any confidence in the Met until they actually believe that you actually have. I, I'm really shocked that there is no criteria. I keep we keep hearing it's down to the individual officers. Um, everything most. Certainly, my day job and everything that we do in the council is set by criteria. There's criteria for things, there's policy, there's reason behind it. Yet, I still don't see coming out of this discussion um, the reasons why police officers do stop and search individuals. And I think that needs to come out after you some after those are answered i'm going to ask the account group to come in because some of the things i'm seeing in the chat um from them make me think that, that you're you may think you're talking to them but they don't think you're talking to them certainly on not not on the correct level and apologies because obviously i can't i can't see the chat no, so well, in terms no. of yeah so in in terms of the criteria though so so one of the things around body one video is the community scrutiny groups look at unredacted body worn video and they also are able to look at the stop search which has got the reasonable grounds on so each of those factors means that that the community groups and, and different people sit on those groups can actually look at exactly what an officer did exactly what their grounds were and then they're able to feed back on on, on their own personal feedback on whether or not there were reasonable grounds whether the officer did well whether the officer could have done better so, so all of that is fed in in terms of being able to to justify it you know we, we do open up our body worn video for scrutiny as well as the stop slip and and that's where the officer has to justify exactly what they've done and write up what they've done and why and that is where they're held to account so we do make sure that we we hold that out in terms of the data and the stats we're happy to provide within the privacy as you've identified the stats that, that each individual group would want through act through Mike Hamer and his scrutiny group. So so the, the question we're asking is is for the information that each individual group wants. And if you haven't been provided mm. that data, then we'll make sure that you do. And again I'll I'll, I'll pause there, but body one video is, is on ninety three percent of our stop and search. Um, areas and it is scrutinised by the community panels who come in and watch it and they independently pick the clips that they want to see. We don't give them the body worn video clips, they choose from a random selection the ones that they want to watch. Okay. Um, Chair, oh sorry. Sorry, um, I've got, I wondered whether the account group wanted to come in and then I'll take Natasha and then I'll take Councillor SA. Hi Sharon, um, I think probably a lot of young people from the group would like to come with, with, with their right. list. Um, Do you want to tell I mean, us who you are? What, sorry? 
Um, we can't see you, Tim. So you can't tell see people who you are. Okay, you can see me now. Um, my name's Tim. I work at Hackney CVS to uh, support young people in the account group, uh, which is a project that they lead to um, hold the police to account in Hackney. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really um, pleased that um, members have kind of referenced the account report, um, especially kind of the work of Yolanda and others. Um, I think if, if people haven't had a time to look through that document, I think that really quite um, clearly sets out everything that the group is trying to put forward in, in a lot of quite rich detail. Um, and we couldn't possibly kind of, um, or the group couldn't possibly put, you know, bring out all of those issues right now. So I'm sure what we'll get from representatives of the group might just be a little flavor, I suppose. And I would just say, please, please have a look at the report if you want to kind of um, see what they are. There's quite clear recommendations in there. Um, those recommendations have been out for a few months now. Um, we have been pushing for stuff in meetings, but um, to be honest, we're not seeing very much movement on any, any of those recommendations. Um, I think, is there anyone from the team that wants to come in, wants to jump in? I, I kind of have a couple of things, um, but I'm aware you've done, you've been very, everyone's been very patient to stay quiet thus far. So I don't want to keep you quiet for any longer. Oh, great wants to come in. I don't doubt that. <laughs> great. Um, is there any issue that you wanted to bring up? Oh, yes, definitely. <clears throat> I'll just like to say, first of all, thank you to all the councillors. We've been ecstatic in our group chat from each of what you guys have said, especially when you bring up our report. It's pure catharsis because sometimes we feel like we're in this alone. And it feels good to know that the people in our council are looking out for us. Um, but I will, I will say one thing because otherwise I will rant. Stop and see. The IO's PC um, said a lot, but all they said was just justifying stop and search to an egregious amount, regardless of the stats. And it, it just seemed like they didn't understand what the problem was when it came down to it. And it also seems like they don't seem to understand that people aren't going to them because they know because they know that nothing's going to turn up. They know that reporting to them is not going to lead anywhere. They don't have any trust in the IOPC. They don't have any trust in the police. Regardless of how of what they have said, the majority of young people, especially young black men, if they if whether the police are interviewing them or not, have very little trust in the police to help them in any capacity. They have very little trust in the police to treat them fairly. And all I've been hearing throughout this call from those who are representatives of the police are lies. If I am to be completely honest with you, they're lies. We've been in meetings with the police. We were just in a meeting with the police and we've on multiple occasions been overlooked on what we have been on what we've said, dealt with disrespect, even outside of meetings, we've met young people who have dealt with disrespect from the police on a multitude of occasions when they are just trying to speak to the police in a natural way, whether that's being stopped, stopped in search, or whether they're just asking for help. It's my question is. How do you guys expect to fix any of your problems when you consistently push the push the responsibility from your high, from yourselves to higher ups onto your lower police officers? It seems like you choose not to take any responsibility for the actions that are being made, regardless of the fact that you are responsible for said actions. If if the king of a nation is a tyrant. And his knights are tyrants as well. Isn't that the king's fault? That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Interesting analogy. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Sharon, I'll maybe um, chair chair. Maybe bring yeah. a couple of sorry, sorry. I just want, sorry. I just want to. I need to interpose here. Um, I'm 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 sorry, great. But I what you all that you've said is right. But please. Do not use the word lies. We don't use those words 
in this committee. We don't call one another, uh, we respect one another. And even if you think that that, it, that might be the case, to, is to say that they're mistaken or to use some other way of saying it. Uh, because um, it's about respecting one another. People don't come here to be abused and insulted and, and really need to remember that. Okay, Matt. thank you. Sorry, Matt. Chair, I just felt we needed to say that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rathbone. Uh, great, have never been to one of these meetings before, so... Uh, yeah. And it's good to hear from uh, the young people on the street how they feel. I, I agree that yes. people shouldn't be called liars, but it's uh, to hear uh, from the young people themselves how they feel, because we've heard, we're hearing a lot tonight from uh, the police about all the consultation they're doing, and it's good to hear from the people who are being consulted about how they feel about it. We've still got lots of questions that haven't been answered. Um, so hold on to that thought about that. Um, as I've got Natasha wanted to come back in and answer some of the questions that are aimed at Mo Mopac. Just trying to work out how to turn my mic on. Um, star six, I am oh. uh, I'm on, I'm on uh, video. Uh, thank oh, you. Video left, um, yeah. So there was a there were some particular questions about kind of there was the point originally about what's going to be different and uh, so I'll address that and then the sort of more specific things about um, the engagement that um, Councillor Pajana Thomas was asking and I think one of the things I'd say is that we're at a watershed moment and I think even this conversation we're having today probably wouldn't have happened a year ago just because you know people are actually more open and receptive to having these hard conversations so I think for a start we start from a basis of actually feeling more able to really challenge each other in an open way and have this conversation. I think also um, the fact that there is so much scrutiny on this means that actually we are all under the spotlight. So both MOPAC in terms of how we hold the Met to account for what they do, but also the Met in terms of their own delivery, it's absolutely been kind of, you know, thrown wide open so that people can see and sunlight's the best disinfectant, right? So I think that gives us a real opportunity um, now to make some differences. Um, in terms of what we will do around kind of our engagement and what that looks like um, councillor thomas is i suppose the thing is that for us one of the key things in terms of our new engagement framework will be around how we diversify some of our engagement activities um you know we have a number of structures that exist that we support but it's it's clear to us that we haven't got enough diversity within those groups and by that i mean in terms of diversity of thoughts experience etc so we're not getting a full picture of how people are experiencing policing services on the ground through those formalized mechanisms um, and so then you will have other things happening on the side that maybe sometimes it bubbles up and you get a sense of that but it, those conversations need to be happening in our regular mechanisms so something about how we diversify them and i think one of the things that's been really interesting and a point well made by both safe and neighbor boards and others is that to make that happen you know actually those structures need more direct support than we currently give to them so you know we provide funding for them to operate and for them to support projects but actually in terms of that kind of community development supporting them to engage more widely and to hold the police to account we don't provide that much support around that and that i think is one of the big gaps that you know has really um, been highlighted through this work and through the work we've been doing with Safe Neighbor Board. So that will be one of the things that we will want to address in the in the kind of the new framework is actually what kind of support do we give those groups at the local level and how does how does that operate? So we're we're really keen to look at that. I think the other thing that's been um, interesting about this conversation and it was highlighted here is that um, some of that information about things like complaints, for example, some of that data is actually available. It is in the public domain, but there are so many different data sets. They're often, in, you know, you know, kind of buried somewhere on a website, hard to access, and potentially, if you find them, as Jane said, they're not always as user friendly as you might want them to be. So, one of the things that we will do um, off the back of the action plan is actually just develop some kind of a, a digest that will bring together some of that key data so that you can readily access it in a format that's really accessible to people. And we're going to try and do that twice a year, where we just collate all of those key metrics that will help us to understand whether or not we're improving trust and confidence is this proportionality increasing you know are, are complaints being dealt with effectively and timely all of those things try and bring those together in a way that enables people to be able to see that at a relatively quick glance without having to go through sort of reams and reams of data which you'd probably have to do now to try and extract the information you want from the complaints data for instance which is is it can be quite difficult to to kind of understand but there must be easier ways of of demonstrating that um, and I think the other thing that was really interesting about the conversation we've just had, it really demonstrates the, and, and Catherine alluded to this, 
the idea about the way in which policing operates and how police officers understand their jobs compared to how the public understands their role and how they carry out their their jobs there is there is a kind of gap between those two things and there there is a really important role i think for mopac the police and others in this space to both expose that fact and let us understand that we don't approach these things from a talk from the same position but then to also work on bringing those two positions closer together and it might not be that we will agree on everything but actually understanding those different standpoints understanding the parameters within which policing operates which are you know to 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 the average member of the public they can be quite archaic there's loads of regulations there's lots of legislation um, surrounding both how they deliver their policing powers but also in terms of things like the complaint system which has lots of um, regulations around it that as a member of the public you wouldn't know or necessarily you might think it's counterintuitive in fact some of it um, so there is something about how we help people to understand that but i think it's also then important and we have people from hackney account on the on the line for instance and and the safe enable board as well to be able to challenge some of that and to be saying to us, well, OK, so now we've understood what our respective positions are on this. Actually, we don't think that's right. And that actually we should be pushing for a different way of doing things. And and that then can feed into some of the work that we do, both in terms of our oversight. But of course, the mayor also has influence. He can lobby government for change, for instance, if we need different legislation to enable us to work differently. Um, you know, we can think differently about how we do scrutiny. But it's really important that we have that, that kind of open communication and can understand what those issues are. Um, so I think this conversation has been really, really helpful in that respect. Um, and in terms of how will we, you know, what will make a difference? Will people know that it's different? That's a really challenging question because changing um, policing, the way it operates or indeed how we feel about it and how we experience it uh, is not something that's going to, it's not going to happen overnight. And I, and I think that is a real challenge for us as public sector bodies, that the things that we do might take time a to implement and we will move as quickly as we can but they will certainly take time probably to to kind of have the impact that we want um and so i think it's important for for, for communities and others to understand that that even if we make changes they won't necessarily have an impact immediately but then i think that's where actually continuing to have those conversations with communities so that we can see whether or not we are beginning to have the right kind of impact is important you know it will be as important to me for people to be able to say well, OK, I still don't agree with the way that this happens, but the process is more open and transparent. I now have a greater understanding of how the Met think they do this. And I've had an opportunity to, you know, talk to them about actually my experience and inform their practice. Um, and I think that's that's a success in its own right, that we enable that to happen. And that is happening locally um, from some of the conversations we've heard today. But, you know, we will need to keep being um, challenged, um, you know, both uh, at the Met, MOPAC and others in this space to keep pushing and to keep being reminded um, of what communities want and whether or not we are achieving that. And I'm 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 really open to the idea that, you know, if we publish the action plan, clearly we'll have a set of actions and things we want to deliver. But if over time we are hearing from communities that they're not delivering the changes that we want, then that means we have to look again at what we're doing because we won't be doing the right things. It won't be enough for us to say, well, here's a list of actions from the plan. Tick, tick, tick. We've done them all if at the end of that we don't actually have people feeling differently and experiencing policing differently. So the, the proof of the pudding will really be in the eating, I think. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got, um, I'll bring Sal back because he's been wanting to come back in. But perhaps um, you you can talk to, I mean, you've, I'm sorry, you've talked about only being able to do this report because you've got, um, Find those complaints and you're able to put them together and uh, look at them as a holistically and bring this report but you've heard from uh, the young people in the account group um that they've got no confidence in the iopc you went to, you went to have a youth you say you, i've been told you've got a youth group uh, i don't know how uh, people get involved in that and who they are and whether any of our young people could get involved in it if they wanted to but basically, how is the IOPC? And I've looking at your stats, um, you only a, a set eleven only eleven percent of all the complaints that came to you were um, found. You found something on them. Eighty nine percent were dismissed. So you know, people say they've got no um, faith in your organisation. Um, so how are people going to have faith? In your organisation, I mean, the report you've done is really good, but 
people well, people will get to know about it i'm sure but um but you've got to, you've got to build faith and confidence as well and i'd be interested to see how you're going to do that thank you um councillor patrick for that i think um i think the conversation earlier uh, by great um you raised some um really kind of challenging points in a really powerful way and i think it really exemplified the point I was making earlier. There is a barrier that we have to overcome as an organization to build that trust and confidence in the system that's there. Now, whether we like it or not, the police complaint system is a system that's in place that's designed to take forward people's concerns and complaints about the police. Now, it was reformed earlier this year to make it a bit easier so that at the end of the process, there was a right of appeal to an independent body to make sure that your complaint was handled in the right way. In terms of the work that we've done here, as I said to you earlier, uh, Councillor Patrick, the work that we've done around the learning recommendations, none of that would have been possible if people hadn't engaged in the system that's there and hadn't made the complaints. It's a message that I kind of put out continuously you know, if you're unhappy with an interaction you've had with the police service, then you must do something about it. Get your voice heard. Get your voice heard in the system that is there. It might not be a perfect system, but it is the system that is in place. Now, by those individuals making those complaints, we were, some of those came to our attention and we did independent investigations. And through those independent investigations, we identified the learning that I've spoken about earlier tonight. And the point was made earlier, you know, about frontline officers getting it wrong and it's really the bigger issues that matter. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. That's why we wanted to, to take those issues which we've seen were happening with frontline officers and pose them to the Metropolitan Police as an organization. Now we made, we used our statutory powers here to make learning recommendations and the Metropolitan Police accepted all 11 of those and you know some of the councillors on here tonight have kind of alluded to their response now that the, the met's response is published on our website all the detail is there in terms of time scales and actions that they want to do now in terms of you know building confidence in kind of institutions it's not what you say it's what you do so we've made these learning recommendations within the powers that we've been given and then obviously our counterparts in the Metropolitan Police are charged with the implementation. And then our counterparts in Mopac are charged with the kind of scrutiny and accountability of these learning recommendations. We've all got a part to play, but the starting place for any concern is, is to engage in the system that's there. Okay. Hopefully one of the recommendations that have come out of this meeting to, um, is that the, the council will work with account to find a way of supporting people who do want to make complaints about their treatment with the police to go forward. Um, because uh, not only have people not got any trust, they don't know, one, it's quite probably quite difficult, and two, um, they, they feel there may be comebacks um, from the police, I'm sure. As there are people on, who won't complain, so often don't want to make complaints because they're worried about comebacks. So I think that's something we as a commission need to look at and make recommendations about how we as a council, I think we need to put our money where our mouth is and help people make complaints uh, when they feel that the police uh, haven't treated them properly. We've heard a lot about, um, I've been too many minutes, we've heard a lot about um, how from the police and from my IOPC about how things are going to improve, how uh, they're consulting with communities community groups but well, i think i'd like to go back to my original question i suppose um about institutional racism about the disproportionality of um black young men who are subject to stop and search um well, i think uh natasha said something about doing it better and you may not like what's being done to you but you know it's being done correctly but um i still feel that there is well, I haven't heard anything about the disproportionality um, that goes on, and uh, not only disproportionality, but the lack of positive outcomes that come out of it for the police. Um, I, in the sense of, um, 
uh, arrests. Um, and I do think, yeah, we've heard, as I said before, we've heard about McPherson, we've heard about Scarman. And I really think that just talking to community groups and checking that stop and search is day and done correctly, it may be done correctly, but well, there is the reason for it being done correctly. And that's what I think we really need. One of the things we need to get out of this meeting today and also the use of handcuffs that have gone up disproportionately in the last three years and the trauma that um, they cause to people um, that it's false uh, people feel that they've been abused with having uh, handcuffs slapped on them no, with no particular reason we i've read about grow wisely and about people being told why they've been stopped why that who people who the people are stopping them their rights um and um, asked to explain themselves but i'm not sure that that's actually happening um we also hear about the bus um protocols um the protocols from the college of policing um but um, from what i've heard and read in the account the group, group uh, report and everything i've been reading on the media that doesn't seem to be filtering through down to um officers um on the ground um so i'll stick that in as a, a way forward um Councilor Patrick, I, I just wondered if i on the question of disproportionality i just wonder if i could add something really um and i guess it's echoing what some of the younger people have been saying about how uh, they're not really hearing of a, a strong connection between what's happening at the senior levels in the police and the lower levels in the police. And I just wanted to give an example from the previous lockdown. Um, we got some statistics out not long ago showing that the number of um, arrests and charges and presumably eventually prosecutions for drugs possession went up very dramatically in that period of the lockdown. Um, and we will recognize that those arrests are very much more going to be disproportionately younger people um and i just wonder what the met have to say about that because it's it's you know i find it incredibly depressing actually that during the last lockdown um the number of drugs arrests and the number of young people who ultimately may end up with a criminal record has gone up for what is often quite a, a, a relatively trivial offense um, so again is that is that business about the proportionality of policing and you know I wonder what the upper echelons of the of the meta saying about that sort of policing on the ground at a time during the COVID lockdown when actually the streets were relatively quiet so maybe it was easier to pick people up for drugs offenses than it would normally have been Thank you. This is Catherine. Can I can Thank I come you. in? Um, I've got Tim who wants to come in. Thank. Thank you. Should we take Tim and Tim's going to say so? Maybe you might respond to both. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and keep mine um, very brief. Again, I'm kind of bigging up the account report. Obviously, I'm biased supporting the work of the young people, but um, there's one key bit of statistical analysis that I wondered if maybe there could be some kind of discussion around or maybe some agreement around um to put it but i mean we you can have debates for hours and hours and days and days about whether or not institutional racism exists in the police and unfortunately we've been having that um conversation for a very long time and it, it can become very draining for young people especially given that many of them have lived experiences of that racism firsthand um so when i'm, I'm not bringing this up to have a debate about whether or not racism exists in the police i think that's um too big for now but it's basically just one statistic that I wanted to highlight, um, which is, Sharon, you talked about outcome rates earlier in the meeting. Um, so that means the amount of time, what percentage um, are people finding, uh, are police finding a prohibited item, so drugs, weapons, etc., on people when they're being searched. Um, the overall outcome rate in Hackney tends to be somewhere around 20-25%. Um, in the report that we looked at, there's a young person called Georgina, who I'll just shout out to you now, who's done all this amazing statistical analysis with the Met's own data. Um, and what you're seeing there is that um, for uh, the general population, the stop and search rates tend to be about, well, is it, sorry, 22.1%. Um, you may agree or disagree whether that's a good figure. Um, but more prominently, what I want to highlight, and this is the one statistic that I do want to highlight, is that the outcome rate for young black men, and I'm talking about um young black men aged 15 to 19 so we're talking about um teenage age group 
um, the outcome rate is 14%. Um, I think that that difference is quite concerning for a lot of um, young people that are doing the report. And I, I feel like one positive change that the group's been pushing for for a long time now <clears throat> in our local engagement with the BCU, but maybe this will be, I want to maybe, I think this is, could be a joint piece of work, MOPAC, IOPC, and the Met Police as well. Um, the young people have been pushing to say, why can't that um, outcome rate be pushed up to equal that for their, um, as those that will be for their white peers? Um, because we've heard a lot about how, um, as the borough commander may have talked about it in terms of, um, as he put it, African Caribbean young men being more responsible for knife crime and robberies, etc. Um, this doesn't that that kind of explanation that's that I've heard all across the Met and at the local BCU doesn't hold up if we look at the outcome, the disproportionality rate and outcome rates. So I want it basically, can we see a commitment from the local police, from the Met Police, from the IOPC, and from MOPAC to push for this disparity in outcome rate to go? And if if we can't, then why not? That would essentially be the question. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Tim. That's. Uh very uh, powerful question and um, i think the command commander rifle was coming back yes i was i, I wasn't um I'll, the, the stop and search uh, questions i will leave to my colleagues sticking around the positive outcome rate i want to right. um forgive okay. me i i, uh, I was, was going to come back in around the uh, work of the bpa i was going to come back to the colleague who said that that he felt that we weren't being honest um, and to reflect on the comments made by Natasha, which is actually, of course, there has to be more than just words, um, but it'll be people like his good self, that if we are able to involve them in what we're doing, if they're prepared to spend some time and, and, and hear what we're doing, and we can then listen to what we should be doing more and differently, that I do believe that it's absolutely reasonable for people who do not have trust and confidence in us to not have trust and confidence in the words that we're saying, but I do invite them to give us a chance to see if we can't do something different. That what I agree with Natasha is a watershed moment. Um, I'm conscious that's not answering, answering the question around stop and search and positive outcomes though, but I would also like to talk about BPA as well, Chair. So do you want me to hand over to my colleague Chain for positive outcomes and then we'll come back to the BPA? Would that be okay? Yes, please. Jane, is that okay? Yes, please. Sorry, Commander Connor, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I don't have the breakdown of, uh, in terms of age. In, in terms of um, across the board positive outcome rates, they are relatively even across um, Asians no. like other and what? No. About 22, 23%. So, so those are the, the MPS figures that I have across the board in terms of all of our stop and search. I don't have the Hackney breakdown, so that's something that you know I'd need to look at, and in terms of the outcome rates and, and whether or not Mike Hamer has the local breakdown. But in terms of the the MPS outcome rate, and it, in terms of we don't have volume targets for stop and search, we don't have target outcome rates. And I've actually been on um, in a meeting, a virtual meeting with the the account group, and I know that is something that has been discussed. Um, and something that, that is definitely something a discussion that we need to, to be able to have. Okay, Councillor and Andy would like to say something. Yeah. I, but, but, but before he he does, I, yeah. I think yeah. the, I think the role of the community monitoring group um, that that engages with the police around the data for our local st stop and search. I think that is the reference group. Uh, I know a report is um, provided and discussed to that group around data, and that does include um, ethnicity and age breakdown. So, 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 I, so I think we do have a reinvigorated community monitoring group. Uh, but I'll hand over to Andy. And we'll talk about um, um, the rest of it. I just want to give the um, give the meeting a, a flavour of some statistics without without overloading people. So. Um, for, for October, so the most recent statistic, the outcome rate for um, white people in general from stop and search was 23%, for, uh, for black people was 27.7%. Now, uh, 
Tim talks about young people in particular, and he's quite right to do so. So between 15 and 19 years old, the outcome rate for, for young white people between 15 and 19 was 20%. And um, for young black people, was 18.3%. So that stat is slightly lower. But then, if you look for um, 20 to 24 years old, the outcome rate for um, young white people was 22.5%. But the outcome rate for um, young black people was 32.4%. So I, I guess my point is we have to be ever so careful when we talk about statistics and we talk about months, years, and whether sort of correlation implies causation and things like that. And, and the most recent statistics don't necessarily play out exactly what, what Tim is suggesting. Well, I, those stats are very different to all the stats I've, I've seen. Uh, I can't see the stats for October, and I don't know whether they are an outliner. Um, but young people still, for even those stats, are still pretty... Uh, Horrendous. You know, we I, all the stuff I've read that says that young that black people are, are ten nationally are ten times more likely to be stopped by the police, and that was in a report that I read that was on the House of Commons um, in the House of Commons Library today. I think in London it's eight times more likely. Um, the young the young people have put in the chat that they um, that they still don't they don't feel. Um, they feel that they are being discriminated. They feel that there is racism in the place. That's why they're being stopped to search. They've been, they are being profiled um, as criminals. Um, and yeah, we've heard from the police, we've heard from MOPAC, we've heard from the IOPC, um, but I'm still not sure how we're going to take forward this uh, and work I've heard about working with young people, but it, I think it's going to take more than just working words um, to overcome um, the racism that they feel. And I think the police, and it's not only the Met, I'm sure, um, sure it's other police forces as well, and uh, both in England and across the world, um, who young people feel, and minorities feel discriminate against them. I just wonder how we're going to take that forward. There's a lot of discussion about training for new officers, and I just wonder what training is going to be given to established officers. We, I do hear different things about established officers. There's some things in reports that say that established officers know how to handle people and they're more respectful. And then in other uh, reports, I read that um, um, officers that have been around a long time uh, aren't as respectful and also um i wonder we haven't really discussed it to, um today but the section 60s and the increase in section 60s and the increase in stop and search during section 60s um now that the um you can call one a lot easier um and the amount and uh, how young people especially feel they're being targeted during um section 60s Councillor, could I just uh, respond to some of that, please? It's Mike. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think I think training is really important, um, and training for our our new officers who arrive, you know, without necessarily understanding Hackney, um, I think is really important. That sort of impact and awareness training. But, but I think training equally needs to be refreshed among all, all of our staff as well, because our experienced officers are the ones. Who, who become the role models, if you like, for the younger officers, and if, if they need to be leading and demonstrating by example. So, so, so I, I think training and refreshing training and um, and bringing people in to help with that awareness thing. We, we we've already started that. I think I think we've got a lot more to do with it. Um, but but fundamentally, and, and and again, what one of the one of one of the review uh, of the objectives of the review of stop and search and the review of body worn video is to recycle that learning you know that, that that encounter in the street and understand how we work on some some of our softer and communicative skills um, with the person who's being stopped and searched at the time and, and if i could just briefly come back to stop and uh, the section 60 so i mean this, this is a lot easier and and less contentious i think to articulate in terms of numbers the numbers are, are relatively few, uh, but it peaked. We had nine stop and searches in May, 
uh, June 5, July 4, August 3, September 4. So, I mean, that, that does correlate with some of the escalations in violence we saw, some of the um, unlicensed music events that we weren't able to uh, get on top of uh, early enough. Uh, and of course, the Section 60 is, is a post-incident uh, when something's happened and we fear there might be repercussions uh, or, or as a, a preventative if we anticipate disorder. So, so it's very much a preventative tool, uh, but, but hopefully that, that will reassure that the numbers ha have not escalated. Um, and I, I, would, I would say to a degree that they are reflective of where our violence profile was um, during that lockdown period. Um, I haven't got the, I can't put my finger on the stop the positive outcomes. But looking at the June report, um, using the police's own, um, there was um, 1,000, 1, uh, sorry, yeah, 122,492 um, stops of people who uh, ethnic periods as black. One, uh, 114,982 um, people who appeared to be white and 51,257 uh, of uh, people from a Asian backgrounds. But now, if you consider that this is disproportionality in the sense of you consider that the, the black people make up a much more proportion of the population. So you, we do have to take into account um, the proportion of the population when we're looking at stats. And I mean, I'm not your October stats. I mean, I haven't seen your October stats. So you just read them out. Well, they are very different to everything that I've seen so far. Both um, that come out of the MS, come out of the police nationally, um, and London wide, and also um, um, that's on the House of Commons. Um, report that I read today. But I just wonder whether we, yeah, we've, we've heard from the young people um, who are very uh, sceptical that there's going to be any change. Oh. Especially when it comes to uh, the disproportionality of them being stopped to search and handcuffed. I've heard a lot about We can't hear you, Chair. It's going to be done better, um, but I wonder if anybody would like to comment on how we can deal with the institutional racism that young people, that the young people sent from the account group uh, feel that there is, there is towards them by, by the police. Um, this is Catherine. May I, may I come in on both the handcuffing, um, the point you just raised regarding institutional racism, and also again, I'd just like to give an update on the involvement of the Black Police Association. Is that possible? Yes, please. So, on the handcuffing review, um, there is a review being underway at the take at the moment. It involves um, community representatives from the IOPC, and it's being chaired by one of our DAC DAC matrix. Um, and it's looking into the use of handcuffs pre arrest, which is primarily linked to research, um, but it's looking at the use of it. Um, it has increased uh, to try and understand why it's increased, and as you um, alluded to already, um, who the handcuffs are being used on and the proportionality there. Um, the, uh, there, there will be some times uh, when handcuffs uh, are appropriately used, uh, but we absolutely acknowledge the fact that there appears to be an increase and that. Uh, there appears to be a disproportionate use of handcuffs to particularly black young men. Um, the review is underway at the moment. It will be made public and it's expected to be concluded before Christmas of this year. Now, I'm not personally involved in that review, so I, I don't have any further details, but um, I can tell you that the review is, is happening uh, and that the result will be made public and hopefully this side of Christmas. Chair, can I just ask a follow up question, please, with regards yes. to the handcuffs? So what is the NPS um, safeguarding responsibility and duty of care? In terms of the use of handcuffs, um, yes, generally, yeah. Yeah. So, so use of handcuffs is, of course, a use of force. And so our responsibility is to make sure that that use of force is, is lawful and, and, and proportionate. Um, and that will be part of the review. So as I said, sometimes there'll be circumstances when it's absolutely quite right to use handcuffs. Uh, and sometimes um, there are there are uses of force, and the use of handcuffs will be one that actually 
isn't proportionate. Uh, that's part of this review. As I say, the IOPC who do hold us to account are part of that review process. I don't know if it's Sal, it may well be Sal who's on this call as well, um, but that's part of our responsibility and our duty of care to make sure that we only use, uh, use the force when it's absolutely necessary. Thank you. Chair, can I add just one question, please, before? Um, yeah. I know we've had a lot of discussion on several, um, on this stop and search trust and confidence. But moving on, I'm just saying, I mean, just, um, I want to ask, what further support? When we are looking at IOPC, we're looking at Hackney Community Safety Partnership, what further support can we provide to young people and the wider community that will encourage them to use the complaint system if they feel unfairly targeted? Because moving on, the complaint system is a key aspect in terms of raising the public awareness and in communicating information about access and process. What further support in, with regards to that? Can, can the IOPC and Community Safety Partnership, how can they, that they can provide to young people? Chair, this is Catherine again. I've been thinking about that question. Is it possible that I can come back and this out? Of course, thank you very much. So, oh, sorry. I'd say I still no. Just come back on my question about racism. So, what, while I'm taking the answer to this, I wonder if anyone wants to come back before we wrap up on um, the issue of racism that uh, yeah. is just in the in the back. I'm, I'm, no, absolutely. I was I was planning to, um, uh, but I was also trying to answer that um, the yeah. um, colleague question as well. In terms of the, uh, I, I agree that. We need to make the process, so, so the fact that we have um, the complaint system at the moment and, and the lack of use of the complaint system, I agree, is not a measure of our success. I ag agree that it's a, it's a lack of trust in the process. So there are, even just with me scribbling them down, there are four different ways that somebody could make a complaint about a police officer. Um, it could be the, to the IFPC directly, it could be to Crime Stoppers, which is an anonymous process. It could be a local complaint that could go to um, managers in the local BCU. It can also be a complaint direction to ZPS. So I would like to make a commitment to your good selves that I, I will, um, I, I don't, uh, I used to work in professional standards in my job prior to this, but I don't now. But I'd like to make a commitment that I'll work with the local SLC to try and find ways to uh, make the process of complaints more accessible, to make sure young people feel more empowered. Um, I'm quite conscious that we have a Hackney account group on here, so you can hold me to account to making sure that we share that information with you. And I think that you're quite right. If we can make a commitment to each other that we do share those processes, then perhaps we will uh, encourage trust in those complaint processes and holding us to account. Is that a reasonable offer? Well, there's actually a account group, but yeah. Um, so, in terms of the um, in terms of the institutional racism, um, our, as the commissioner has recently said, you know, um, she does not consider that the organisation is institutional racist, and I do not consider that the Metropolitan Police Service is institutionally racist. However, I do consider that there are issues that we still need to work through. That there are issues of bias, unconscious bias, or conscious bias. There are four, there are nearly forty five thousand people that work um, either in the organisation or work around the organisation. And so there is going to be the best of society in the 45,000 people, and then there's also going to be, very sadly, the worst. So I do not believe that the organisation is institutionally racist, but I do believe that there are significant challenges and that there are significant challenges with regards to trust and confidence. And this entire evening with your good self and the ongoing work that will happen either with me or with Jane or with your local SLP is part of that process to show that we're truly committed to try and change that situation of trust and confidence. Um, but I hope that answers your question around institutional racism. Okay, I've got. To, I'm being asked. Uh, yeah, I want to bring this to a close fairly soon. But I'm going to bring in uh, Councillor Ozen, and then I'm going to bring in um, Gray and Newlander from the um, account group, and then we'll try and wrap this up. Um, so, uh, Councillor Ozen. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm just going to make it very quick and then I like to ask uh, commanders and superintendents uh, that would it be useful for uh, for them 
to when when the police officers on the front line on the ground when they stop and search if they if they do for the every stop and search for every individual case if they do uh, camera video recording and giving the person who has been stopped and searched and giving the reference number for that and uh, or password or server and then they can they can download or uh, store all those uh, camera uh, video, video recording on their website somewhere so if anyone would like to make a complaint they can go into it they can get the copy of it so they can raise that to relevant uh, institutions relevant relevant places uh, for their complaint uh, and then uh, so wouldn't be possible that's that's my question to be honest. thank you thank you i've got um yolanda um Thank you, Sharon. Can Sorry. you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I kind of just wanted to back up your point um, about the institutional racism. I, I made the comment in the chat before they supposedly answered your question. But um, one thing I wanted to state, it's not really a question, it's more of a statement. But um, you're, you, um, I can't remember the officer that spoke at, and answered the question. I can't remember your name, so forgive me. But you mentioned about how widely spread um, the, the police aren't racist. But then if we look at areas where um, the black, and I don't like the term BAME, so the black and Asian community are suffering from the hands of the police, there isn't a lot of them. We aren't, we aren't all over the UK. So the areas that you're focusing on, they're not going to be areas where a lot of black and Asian minority people are residing in. So you can't use that as statistics and say, oh, the metropolitan um, the police aren't racist because of areas like this. When we're looking at areas like Hackney, we're looking at areas like Tottenham, those areas that consist of a lot of black and Asian uh, minorities and are coming out and saying that we're being racially targeted by police, you have to take that into consideration that it's completely different from certain areas that don't have a lot of black and Asian people. And also, I wanted to state um, another thing, which I mentioned earlier in the chat, that you can't expect a change to actually come forth if you can't even see that there is a problem. We've had a conversation with the likes of Jane Connors and um, Andy Paul, we were just on, on the meeting with him before, but we've had this countless times, and this is why we're saying that you guys aren't listening to the young people when we're speaking, because we've said this numerous times, that there is a huge issue with institutional racism, yet countless occasions you've ignored that, We've come to you with statistics from our own research and from statistics from your own um, bodies and showed you that there's a problem, but yet still no one can actually put their hands up and say there's a problem. But yet what you are doing is passing, passing on that responsibility to the everyday officers and saying, oh, it's down to them to make a decision whether or not their stop and search is legit or whatnot. However, that power can't be on them because if I'm working in a workforce and I make a mistake as an employee, the pressure is not necessarily going to come down on me first. It's going to come down to the directors and the owners of that company. So at some point, those who are in power have to take responsibility. And yeah, that's all I wanted to say. There isn't a question, as I said, it's just a statement, but thank you for the time. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap this meeting up. I've got uh, Council Woolley, I've got Sal, and then I'll ask Council Woolley um, as our policy leader, she wants to come in. I, I, I was after Yolanda. Did you want to come back? Yes. Um, 
is it okay for him if i can oh great sorry great <laughs> very right. quickly okay yes no mine yeah. is also a statement so i'm going to be as quick as possible regardless of what um of how the police feel the facts speak otherwise you know um, if i can use a statement that has been on a multitude of two vacations used against us facts don't care about your feelings and the fact of the matter is the police is institutionally ra racist if we look at it from a stop and search perspective from a persecution perspective and even from just how you respond to calls you use racial profiling and you use racial profiling most often when you are doing stop and search regardless of how you feel that is the fact of the matter it is not just us saying this there are multiple credible sources and investigative bodies in the uk and in the world that will back up our statements on this so regardless of how you may feel about it institutional racism is the major problem in the police all right thank you i'm done <laughs> okay thank you very much it was a very powerful statement from you and from newlander and uh, i think the police have heard you loud and clear about how you uh, how you feel um sal and then uh, councillor williams just uh, thank you uh, councillor patrick very quickly um, one of your colleagues raised the point about building awareness of the police complaint system. Obviously, it's something I've mentioned in this meeting several times. We have developed some resources working with our own youth panel on a guide for young people on how to access the police complaint system. After this meeting, I'll make sure to share some of those resources with yourselves to maybe share within your networks. Just, you know, in the effort to build awareness of the system that's in place. So I'm I'm happy to share that after the meeting. Okay, okay. Councillor Williams, did you want to come in? Yeah, th thank you for um, letting me, inviting me to speak. Uh, it has been fascinating um, listening. I'm not a member of the commission, and I was last at this commission meeting in July, and that also um, was a fascinating meeting for different reasons um i think the met have been much better prepared this down time to respond to comments and questions from the commission and from hackney accounts as well um but at the end of the meeting it would it, I, I think i'd be correct in suggesting that we're still no further on than we were at the july meeting um i do struggle with the concept that there is an institutional racism in the police um and and i think that institutions within society and society itself have mechanisms uh, it's been well reported and recorded and researched that institutions within society um are have racism built into them um both consciously as well as unconsciously. I don't think that we can just turn to conscious and unconscious bias um, and say that that exists within the individuals who work within that organisation. Um, I think that that gives the organisation too much of an easy out to, to blame individual members of staff without looking at the systems um, of such an organisation. Um, and I do, I do, there is one other point that I'm, I'm going to finish on because I don't really want to take too much of your, of your time. But I do also think it's important to remember um, there was an important principle that was written into the Lawrence Inquiry about racism and people defining their own experiences of racism and the impact of denying that racism on those individuals, whether it's the institution that denies it or individuals within that institution that deny it. Um, and it is incredibly damaging to do so. Um, and it's a principle that um, I, may, I may quite be wrong. <laughs> it's, a, it's a principle that, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, still exists. If somebody tells you that 
I am experiencing racism, um, then we should be listening to those individuals who say what their experience of racism is. Um, and and, and I, I know that the, um, the Met Commissioner has denied for a long time that there is institutional racism within the Met. But I do think that, um, and I'm trying to be very measured here and, and very just and very fair, um, but I do think that we all need to be very careful about taking time to reflect on our organisations that we are all part of. Um, and it's very easy to, um, I think it's very easy to be defensive um, because we all take those accusations very, very personally. Um, and we want to to think the best of the organisation that we are part of because we identify with it on a, a very personal level. Um, but if we can set our own selves aside um, and look at and listen to what our residents are saying, what our constituencies are saying, um, and what society is saying, then I think that that kind of gives us an indication of the problems and the issues and the challenges ahead. Um, I think that the Met has come a long way, um, but I think that there, as have all institutions, but I think that the Met still has a, a long way to go. And I, I really do hope that today's conversation um, opens an opportunity for us to work closely together, to continue to work together. I appreciate um, the that the Met have agreed to signing up to um, the uh, the charter that we adopted as a council back in July to be an anti-racist organisation. Um, I, I I I really welcome the fact that the Met Police are signing up to our inclusive leadership approach as well. So I think there's 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 a lot of work that has been done. Um, dialogue has been great at all levels um, and, uh, and I hope that today isn't the end of the dialogue but a continuation of a really important conversation between the council, the Metropolitan Police as well as Hackney Account. Um, I hope that everyone leaves here today not feeling bruised, battered or beaten up um, but challenged and challenged robustly uh, and quite rightly so. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to just reflect on what I've heard this evening, Councillor Patrick. Thank you, Councillor Williams, for that per um, pertinent statement and uh, also about the good work that's um, going on as well between the council and the police, because we do know there's lots of dialogue that happens at a local level and a lot of it's good uh, about on both from the police and from us. Um, with that, I'd like to call this item to a close. I'd like to adjourn the meeting for five minutes and when we come back we will take uh, the minutes of the last meeting and, and um, the work programme. So if it's uh, approximately half past now, um, we'll come back at 25 to. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone that attended. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, from Catherine Rofer and thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, Chair. That's some Tasha Palmer. Thank you, um, and thank you to the committee. Bye bye. Everybody. Thanks very much from the account group. Thanks to Cam. Yep. Thank you for having us. Hi, we're very big fans of all the councillors. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you guys on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, councillors. From. Um, thank you. Mike and Andy, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate your time. Okay, Jane you've got five Thanks. minutes. Bye. -bye. Um, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Hi, Natasha. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you. for sending. Yeah. Okay. It's official. Okay. It's on the screen. You've got your comfort break.
going to read it now, so I'm going to shut myself off and stop presenting my screen while okay. Mary. If everyone's here, we can restart. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, and welcome back to the meeting. Um, I think we've had a very interesting discussion, and I think there's been movement um, between the police um, and. Uh, the community but i think there's a lot more work to do as we heard from uh, the young people um from the account group i do think perhaps we need an, uh to, to bring this subject back and uh i will talk to the police and consult with um councillor williams and Fajana thomas about when the best time is whether it should be six months or whether it should be a year but i do think it's something that we should um carry on keeping um under on our radar because it's a very important issue um for member for the residents of Hackney. Um, moving on from that, we had the minutes of our last meeting, um, which is at item five. Um, can we agree the minutes of uh, the last meeting? And that was on our meeting about uh, Thames Water in particular, who are coming back. I think it's Mark. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. And although it didn't affect the people of Hackney, there has been another water main burst, um, which uh, was all over Hackney Marshes and Woodland, but it didn't affect right. Hackney, it affected our neighbours uh, to the east. So uh, okay. we can talk, to, we can tell them about um, the work we've been doing with Thames Water and see whether any of it's useful to them. Uh, right, yeah. the work programme, uh, can we agree the work programme for the remainder of the year is item six? Agreed. Yeah. I, I did just wonder. Um, we did talk, um, we did talk briefly about on. whether or not we should um, we should be looking at the roads at all. Um, There's a backbench it, members group to do that, Penny. That Councillor that Councillor Gordon is. Um, is leading. Yeah, that. Doing, yeah I, I do know that. I just I was just thinking. I just wonder if we should do something publicly as well. Uh, because yeah, it's uh, yeah, not under our remit. Uh, not? Captain Mette's okay. uh, commission is going to is doing some public work on that. On that. Yes, okay. he is. Okay. Yeah. Transport, doesn't, yeah, transport doesn't come under us, and it's this is a big transport. So uh, working in Hackney or whatever it's called these days is actually going to be doing some public work around, around that. I think it hasn't been forgotten but there is a back bench working group to, uh, as well to support the cabinet on the work that's being done okay with that can i thank everybody for coming and uh, everyone uh, yeah, for yeah, 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 sorry I, I thought we were still on discussing the future work program because uh, i, I yeah, sorry yeah. because you, you you we were just talking about about it and sorry. about uh, and then we got on to the commission i just wondered if we could spend get half an hour 20 minutes next time just on on this subject to just take forward some of the things that have, have happened because particularly as the police are saying that they will um have completed their review which a commander roper was talking about um and and it would be interesting if we could get any details or progress on that review and also just to talk to young people and I mean, I, we, during the meeting, we've said that we would meet. I'd, 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 I'd like, I'd like to see the commission actually meet the young people separately to talk through their issues, yeah. if we can, obviously on Zoom. But just, just to have, as well as that, to have um, half an hour of our next meeting, if we can, or the meeting in January, just, just to keep, keep the issue going and looking at it, because obviously it's very important for young people and i wouldn't sit want them to just think we had one meeting and we went away and nothing happened i really just wouldn't want to see that i would like to see them think that we are you know paying attention and getting on with it i agree entirely that we should meet the the account group and we should take it um but um i'm not i think perhaps december will be too early because i don't know when those reports of it are going to be out yeah maybe january January, um, should be okay. January should be okay. We've yeah. got the green infrastructure and pl um, play um, in January, but I'm sure I'll talk to Tracy and see if we can um, fit it in. If not, 
so we could probably definitely fit it in in February. Yeah, um, I think actually um, it could work quite it. well, having the young people, when we're talking about green infrastructure and what have you, they yeah. the parks so much, don't yeah. they? Would, you know, yeah, yeah that's that's very yeah. that's a very good yeah. I quite agree with that Penny. Yeah, that's a very yeah. good suggestion. Okay, we need to try to work on it. <clears throat> and chair, chair, yeah. chair, would it be would it be gets the you know the LT, LTM? Uh it's a big issue. It's gonna become more bigger issue in the future. Shall we put it in our next uh, our LTN is not LTN, LTN, LTN. LTN. The low traffic neighborhood. No. Yeah. So shall we? Shall we? No. Shall we get in our agenda? No, it's not under our commission. It doesn't come under us. Doesn't come under us. Meta is looking, going to be looking at it. Working is look is going to be looking at it. I don't know when, but it's not under us. SEG is doing it on the twenty third of November. Tracy's just put in the chat. Yeah. Uh, 23rd of November, it's being done um, under um, uh, SEG. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, it, it's being done, but it's not under our remit to do trash. Sorry, what is the SEG? Uh, what oh, used to be the econ economy? Skills, economy. 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 Sorry. Only one Skills of them. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. Yeah. I, used to, <laughs> I, I used to be in that com commission. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and and just to say as well that our own and working the, party, we have we have two further meetings which are as it were private. And then what we're planning is to have a, an open meeting which yeah. the opposition councillors can come to. So there'll be further discussion in that. But by then, hopefully, we'll have got all our ducks in a row and, and sorted out all the bits that we are concerned about. Yeah. What? It is a public meeting, Ian. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say public meeting, but you know, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, there is, there is a meeting to support the, the, cap, the, back, the, the back bench meeting to support the cabinet. And, and then there will be some more public meetings. Uh, Yep. So we, we're taking me. We're taking on board the um, into the work program to have a follow up with the young people, um, I, and invite them um, to come back in January. And and perhaps once all the pops are out, perhaps um, in May or June, we could actually take have another a, a, a public do this again um, with the yes. police. I think because they still so. their a lot of their reports they're talking about being out in November and January, November. Mm. So, and like they they should have an action plan and I have some uh, comments in their action plan by then. So perhaps we yes. don't know the meeting in May, but maybe June, whenever it is. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Do we have any any planning policy? Oh. Wow. Wow. Where are you? <laughs> I it's okay. No, it's not me. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Either. I never create those kind of voice. Never. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was me. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Councillor Ozen, planning policy. Yeah, yeah, do, um, do we have anything in our future work? Uh, yes, um, Councillor Nicholson is coming. Um, January, no? Planning January. policy, because there is a uh, proposal from the central government, as, you, yes. as so we all know. The council already responded. Yeah. The yeah. council already responded to the, to the consultation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure Councillor Nickerson can tell us about what the response is, but the council has already responded formally, and I think if you check the council's website, it will be on there. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 I'm just asking you just if you have it yeah. in our work program. That's it. Specifically, because it's already been dealt with. Um, and then, no point in wasting time on something it's already been dealt with. Yeah. Anthony should be more interested about that. <laughs> because of his work. <laughs> I'm not starting some. It's very interesting that, you know, we have such limited time and we need to concentrate on things where we can uh, make 
positive recommendations um and uh, so with that if anybody else if no one else has got anything no chair chair i think we're coming, out, we're coming out of lockdown on the 2nd of december and the next yeah. meeting is after lockdown so just thinking if we can meet for end of year maybe virtual wine you you have your wine and then we just do virtual i don't know um, well let's say what so think, think about it a virtual a virtual a virtual meet glass of wine afterwards yeah we can do yeah. that afterwards. yeah great idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one more thing one more thing here is about health about the mental health and during the old Lockdown, yeah, that's not lockdown. us, Councillor Rosen. That's no. um, <laughs> that's health scrutiny. Yeah, I know. You need to call to Councillor Hayhurst. We just don't. It's not under our remit, and we don't have time. Chris, Chris is better buddy to get more information. Stop, yeah. stop, stop giving us work. Yeah, <laughs> we have plenty of work to do. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, yeah. with, I'm going to close the meeting and thank yeah. you everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank